What do you want? I just need a TI launch pad. Can't you see I'm busy here? Don't, Don't be, be held hostage by, by the board, board order. Go to digikey.com to find thousands of boards in stock all ready for immediate shipment. Hey everyone, welcome to Make Live for uh, September. My name is Tyler Weingartner. I'm the video producer here with Make Magazine, and today I'm joined with uh, Mike Sinisi. Hi everyone, Mike Sinisi. Good and to see you. Uh, the other person being joined uh, that we're joined with today is uh, the author of the project we're building today. We're building Becky Stern's uh, social status tracker, and uh, on the other end of a video call is Becky Stern. Hello, nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me and building my project. Yes, it is a really cool project. What, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Okay, sure. So I have the one that I built here. It's it's a simple like shadow box display with uh, some seven segment displays inside it and an ESP8266 board that's just uh, using a bunch of API libraries to grab my follower account from all the different social sites that matter to me. I also have a, a separate YouTube one that was like that inspired the project to begin with because uh, it looks like the YouTube play button that you get uh, when you get a certain number of subscribers and I wanted mine to be an active counter and then I thought it would just be nice to put all the rest of the networks that I care about uh, into a different display. So it's just like a shadow box that I got on Amazon and um, the displays press right up against the sheet of paper I printed out with the logos on it so that it gives it a clean look. Right, because you've, you've done a lot of experimentation with like diffusion of, of LED and other lit displays. Um, we're going to be a little bit more raw here. Um, I'm going to be just uh, doing the, the, these bare seven segment displays. I'm also going a little bit bigger than your original one. Uh, we're actually going to be displaying this in DigiKey's booth at Maker Faire New York next week. So I want to go a little bit bigger. Um, and then otherwise, show exactly. off the actual components if it's going to be at DigiKey's booth, right? True, yeah. Um, well, and uh, otherwise, we're just going to be mounting it to foam core, and we'll put it in a frame too. And this is actually going to be combining this current project with a previous version of it because, well, we're doing this for um, all of DigiKey's uh, social um, things, but they aren't really involved on Instructables. Uh, so we want to bring in their YouTube subscriber count. Uh, so we're you know, kind of combining the two different projects together. Um, 
And the reason why we're doing all this, uh, all this uh, in the in the spirit of DigiKey is because they are the people who actually make this entire show possible. Uh, if you're not, not familiar with who DigiKey is, they're an electronics distributor based here in the U.S. and they will sell you every single component that you need to build this project or whatever project you're working on, whether that's uh, single board computers or uh, you know microcontrollers like this guy that we're building this here. This is the, the Node MCU ESP8266 ESP board, um, all the way down to resistors, capacitors, whatever you need to build your project, whether you need it for through hole surface mount, uh, they'll, they'll sell it to you. They will ship it to you quick. Um, sometimes I've even ordered stuff in the afternoon and it shows up on my, on my desk the next morning, which I don't understand how that happens. That seems like witchcraft, but, uh, but they, they make it happen. And uh, they make this show possible, and uh, so for that, we're, we're super happy to be working with them. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we've got a project to build, or I've got a project to build, so I'm going to get going with building it. Um, the very first thing I need to do, I should pull up my camera so you can see what I'm going to be working on here. Tyler, while you're pulling that up, I'm going to throw a note out there that if you guys are watching and you have questions, you have comments, um, we are streaming this both on our Facebook channel and on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm trying to keep my eye on that over here. So I will try to facilitate getting your questions answered. Please try to keep them on topic. Uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to have conversations. Yes. Um, so uh, let's take a look here at what I'm looking at. So this is the back of these uh, large-ish seven-segment displays. Um, well, that's the front of it. And the back, um, if you look, where am I looking? Right here, you get a little bit closer pic picture there once I start soldering. Um, it, are these three addressable pads? So I have six of these displays here, and they all run on the, the I squared uh, C you know, serial bus interface. Uh, so I need to give a different address to each and every single one of them so that the microcontroller knows which board to send, or which uh, display to send which numbers to. Uh, so that's the very first thing I need to do. Uh, so I'm going to fire up my soldering iron here. I just need to add a little, just need to bridge one of those uh, solder pads. Um, and I've made some remark here as to which one is which, and I hope I kept my notes straight. Um, this display, if I trust the packaging, uh, is red, so I marked it with a red dot, and that's number two. Of course, we have number one here. And then we'll match all this stuff up in the code when we get into that a little bit later on. Um, but in the meantime, uh, our soldering iron is nearly warm enough. Uh, so we're going to get started doing that. It's really cool that the uh, I squared C displays can all be daisy chained together because they only use two pins on your microcontroller. So if you're working with something like the Node MCU that doesn't have a ton of uh, space on it, it's a pretty compact board. You don't want to have like a bunch of different solder connections clogging it up. These just like daisy chain to each other and then you address them. And if you do make a mistake, Tyler, you can change the address in the code accordingly so that as long as two displays don't have the same address, you're all set. Um, I've been playing around with I squared C for a little bit now, but I think this is actually my first time of running multiple things uh, on the same, you know, having multiple devices. Well, actually, no, I've had multiple uh, disparate devices, but never like multiple of the same kind of display. So this will be this will be new things for me. I'm excited. Um, okay, and I brought along my cheat sheet here. Um, and okay, so we're going to call the red one, and this is red number one. Uh, and I actually, don't need to solder anything to this one because this is going to be our our high or low digit display. I think this is red, so we're going to make that to be for YouTube. Uh, but on red 2, which will be our high digits display, I need to short A0. So that's this one. That's this solder pad right there. And here's my solder. And yeah, I cannot stress that enough. If you have any questions for for myself, for Becky, about how this project works, or anything else about this project, pop those into the chat and we will, we will answer them for you. 
you know what I'm I, I'm surprised about is the 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 size of these uh, the seven digit display here um, is this looks larger than the one that you posted in your uh, in, in your videos for these is that is that correct? Yeah, Tyler's going super size. I mean, mine, I, I didn't quite go with five by seven frame, and I'm using the 0.56 digit height, 0.56 inch digit height. Okay. And uh, he's using like the the 1.2 or larger, right? The the yeah. giant, the biggest ones. Yeah. Well, I didn't quite go with the. SparkFun makes like sing single digit seven segment displays that are like 6.5 inches tall. I didn't quite go that big. I didn't want to like do that high school football scoreboard. But yeah, we, we could do that. Tyler, yeah. real quick, I think you got to switch to this camera so they can see the. Oh, that's right. I am. They can I've see been, the, that, was, that solder bridge that you just did. So, well, you can see this solder bridge that I just did, but don't, don't worry. There's more. I've got a couple more of these to do. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, this is our high digits for YouTube. Uh, so this is going to be our, our second display in the series. The first one, um, because the first display in the series, I didn't de need to do anything. That's, um, I can't quite get them both in at the same time. So that's that one there. I didn't need to make any modification. But this one, I needed to drop in that solder bridge on A0. So those are done. Next up, we have, what should we do green? Green seems like a good color for Instagram. Or maybe Twitter. Instagram. Let's call it Instagram. So this will be display OX73, which requires a short on A0 and A1. So that'll be those two. Brian just joined us in the chat. Irish Brian, who we didn't think was going to be able to make it because it's so late in Ireland. He's up late. He's the one who wrote the uh, API libraries that I used for developing this project. He wrote the Arduino Twitter uh, API library, the Arduino Instagram API library, the in Arduino Instructables API library, and the Arduino YouTube API library. So thanks, Brian. <laughs> He for making code that's really easy to use to build this project. <laughs> no kidding. He also created the code. We built one of his projects on this show last year, which was his uh, his like traffic display. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, his live traffic indicator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is uh, one of my favorites. In fact, I actually have that now um, hanging up in my office at home. We installed it in a uh, a piece of artwork that uh, that I had saved aside for many years. It was a gift. From my wife before we got married, and um, it's uh, I look at it every day. I, I love it. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for uh, for joining us too on the uh, on the chat. Um, and I even forgot to really talk about this show for anybody who hasn't been following it. Um, so this is a a show where we build projects. Um, sometimes straight out of the pages of Make Magazine. Sometimes from our community, like this one. Um, live on the air, um, but this is a, a fun one because, well, while this show has only been around for two years in this version, uh, the, the name Make Live has been around for quite some time, uh, primarily because of you, Becky. Oh, yeah, that's true. I did used to host Make Live in its first iteration in 2011, I think it was. Conceived in 2010, executed in 2011, perhaps, with uh, Matt Richardson, and I hosted a bi-weekly webcast that was, uh, it was, uh, we had guests and we did um, like video segments outside of the studio that we would bring in and live demos and it was really a lot of fun. We filmed it in the um, the old MakerBot space here in Brooklyn. Okay. Did you guys broadcast that live per the name? Yep. Yeah, we did. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we did. Yeah, I would hope so. I mean, <laughs> it's not live if it's not live. We would, um, on Ustream, actually, and then because you, YouTube streaming was like hard or did wasn't real yet, maybe I don't remember exactly why we were on Ustream, and then we would put the segments later on YouTube, so you can find them on this channel in an old playlist, probably buried yeah. somewhere. Um, and we would 
segments out like for a short form each instead of the whole show we, you can watch the whole show as a podcast do you remember those i know those are real again podcasts um <laughs> you can get the video podcast and yes yeah, so we had it in all these different formats but we did broadcast it live um and it was a ton of fun it, i think it's best experienced uh via its clip shows there's two like clips videos best of best of season one mm-hmm that are uh, a nice representation of what we what we got up to. Each show had a theme. It was a lot of work, to be honest. But it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now we're doing display OX72, which is A1 shorted. And then we're and then we'll just have one more display to do, and then we'll be almost done. And then we need I to. Having trouble, like. Uh, coordinating those two things. Like the address, you call it in the code, and the things that be shorted on the board uh, were tough to keep in my head at the same time. I did just notice in this listing here that the um, the numbering got a little bit out of sequence, so I might need to do a little bit of code modification. I almost wonder if I want to make a, a notation on the back of like, just write in Sharpie what the address of each of these. Yeah, right? Are. You have the space, you might as well. Yeah. But do it once you verify it with the code, right? So you can be sure. I suppose so. The yeah. correct label is kind of worse than having no label. Yeah. All right, so that is OX72, and then we got to do OX75, which is A0 and A2. And then we're done. Ish. Then, well, it's so much easier with those display backpacks. It's so much easier than the old way. You guys remember the old way, right? Um, I actually haven't messed around that much with seven segment displays before Before Adafruit made it really easy. Each one has an LED, right? So each segment is an LED. So you have to multiplex a bunch of LEDs to get any, to get one digit working. And then you just need, you just need a lot more IO pins than two. Yeah. Like a lot. I think that's why I avoided it. Yeah. So it's a lot of solder connections and then the code is a lot more complicated too. Yeah, so the backpack really brings down the, the barrier to entry for this type of project. Yeah, sort of. the only other displays I'd really worked with were the um, were the LCD displays. I, I bought them from Sane Smart. That was like the the two by sixteen character displays, but I think they just used some analog source rate for the data connection between it and the Arduino, and then you just call in the library and say, "Here, have it write this," and it goes, "Okay." Well, it could have its own chip, too. Yeah. Um, OK, so that is all of those taken care of. Um, I'm going to pair these back, all back up again, so at least I have them organized. So that's green. I think I already did get these all mixed up. Go me. <laughs> well, you're also like talking about it as you're doing it. Right. That's yep. not exactly the easiest thing to do. Um, I should probably correct for that because when I get these mixed up, I'll get the colors mixed up, and that's that's not going to do me any favors. And so these little coats here, those are the colors. Is that no? Is, the, the, is that the indication? The no. This is the address. This is the location uh, of them. Um, I can help you. Why don't we do it together? I have the list of what they should be, and and yours should be just slightly. Like, I have the addresses with the pins shorted right in front of me. Why don't you run it by me? Yeah, so my, my concern here is that, uh, like, these two should be matched up, but the problem is is that the one in my right hand is green and the one in my left hand is yellow. So that's going to Oh, that's not good. But do you have some solder wick or a, a desoldering bulb tool? Because it's pretty easy to fix. Yeah, I just need to grab um, a go. solder sucker, which is right at my feet. Kaboom! If I wanted to leave and go, go get over to my backpack, I have a really nice one that I keep in my bag. But well, we'll we'll, we'll carry on the with it. Silver Japanese one. Yeah, that one is so I good. That. I talked about it on the Cool Tools podcast recently. I can't remember what the name brand is, but the little Japanese silver Japanese solder sucker with the red button. Yeah, I. I so nice. The, the silicone tip is what does it right because you can make that really good seal. That, there, there's that aspect to it, and the, my other favorite part of it is that I have relatively small hands, and the with the, what, with this one, I always find myself needing to either change my grip 
or like get the other hand on it to do that. And with the, the engineering one, I can keep my position in my hand and just reach up with my thumb and reset it without having to take the other hand off the soldering iron. And that, that's my favorite feature of it. That and you know, get, being able to get the really good seal and, and, and actually lift off a good amount of solder. I feel like now that we've talked about it so much, I should go grab this um, so we can show everyone. Uh, let me go grab it so you don't have to rummage through my bag. But yeah, let me let me get, get well, that. Well, I can grab mine. How about I grab mine? OK, you could do that. Mine's probably the most easily accessible one. OK. Um, so I am trying to keep this straight. So this is yellow 2, and yellow 1 needs to be what color are you using yellow for? Yellow, I think, is going to be Twitter. So Twitter high digits should be A0 shorted, and Twitter low digits should be no alteration. Um, although I think you're reading, like, I'm going to, like, the first two displays are going to be YouTube. Um, then? Then, I, and so that should be... The low so digits, no alteration, and the high should be z a zero. zero. Okay, and I think that one is correct. And that's and the one then, I have in red. Okay, and then which spot is Twitter going in? The second or the third spot? Third spot. Okay, third spot is uh, high digits, a zero and a two, and low digits, a one shorted. A zero and a two, and low digits a is a one. I did do this right. Okay, so this is Twitter low digits in yellow. Hooray. Right. Okay. Cool. I have the solder sucker too if you want to put yeah. the answer. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so now I'm looking at green, which is going to be Instagram. And that's in the middle spot? For low digits or high? Well, the, the like of the three oh, in the middle. Yes, right? in, the, the, in the middle stack, yeah. In the middle stack, the um, high digits is A2 shorted. Yeah. And for the low digits, A0 and A1 shorted. Okay. Now I'm, now I'm realizing maybe I didn't have Twitter as correct as I thought I wanted it to be, as I wish it was. But we'll correct that after I correct this. So you said... Okay, cool. Now show us, I'm, not, I'm not using the solder sucker, so now show them using the solder sucker. I have shown off the solder sucker in my best Vanna White ability. <laughs> now um, I'm ready for the sound. So I'm sorry, run that past me one more time. This is the low display for Instagram. In the middle. In the middle. In the middle. In the, so Instagram's in the middle. Uh, low for Instagram should be A0 and A1 shorted. Okay, so I need to pull this bridge off of A2. Teamwork makes the dream work. I like that. Shake your hands, sure don't. <laughs> but that's the wages of doing stuff live. Maybe I do need to get my the good one. I'm not sure if I'm. I wish I could like solder suck it through the screen. <laughs> you got it though. You just need to break the bridge. You don't need to remove all the solder. That looks that looks like a broken solder joint. Yeah. Yeah. I think get a really good focus on here. And then for that one, you need to bridge the A1 instead. Yeah. I think anyway. <laughs> I mean, I'm reading my own tutorial. I hope it's right. <laughs> I think it's right. <laughs> no guarantees here. I also I didn't use. Um, my networks, only my YouTube and my Twitter have over 10,000. So for my Instagram and my Instructables networks, I only used one of the seven segment displays. So you're using, uh, so I have addresses written in the tutorial for displays I did not actually install. Yeah. I, um, uh, I think they're right. In all fairness, DigiKey only has, I think, 3,000 uh, followers on, uh, on Instagram. So if you're not following them on Instagram, do. So that we need this extra display, but right now we don't. Well, future proof, right? Yeah. I, I actually was really trying to cram it all into this five by seven frame, and I needed a place for the microcontroller to go. And if so, when I outgrow this display, like I'll have to put it in a bigger frame because the um, 
this like the displays don't go all the way across the area that would be taken up by more numbers is actually where the node MCU board fits in. So uh, I did it by force of space and for you know to reduce the cost of the project. If I I'll, installing those extra digits for me is like a rite of passage when I make that milestone, but you're making it as a gift, so it's like a different you know correct. Uh, now run this past me again. For Instagram high, we would just want A2. Correct. Awesome. Okay. If you have Instagram in the middle of the sign. That's correct. Yeah. And then for Twitter, which will be on the bottom, uh, low, high, I think we need to correct um, low digits first. And you said A0 and A2? Low digits for your bottom position display should be just A1. Just A1. And high digits for your lower position display should be A0 and A2. Okay. And this is... So I need to correct both of these because I have, this should be high digits because this is yellow two, just for, just to keep my notes straight. Um, oh, you're, oh yeah, okay, for Twitter, yeah, yeah, yellow for Twitter. And this is, so I need, that should be the way low digits is uh, with just A1 uh, soldered, correctly? Correct? A1 for the low digits. Okay, so. That's wrong. Although maybe I could just ruin my life by just changing the labels. Nothing. Else. But we can also sort it in the code. As long as your, as long as the high digits and low digits are the same color, we can switch which one is in which slot. Yeah. But did you solder your high, your top position signs correctly? Yes. Because that... so then, so then the fastest thing is to just adjust the lower ones. Yeah. All right. So. To save on re-soldering, um, you're gonna label them. I'm gonna relabel this one because this is correct for low-digit uh, Twitter. The bottom display is just right, a one. Uh, right. Yeah, right. Low-digit Twitter on it. Okay, so that will be yellow. No longer two, but one. Because it has a one shorted. Yeah, it has a one shorted. Right. And now for the highs, I need to, right now I have a zero and a one shorted, and I need to change that a one to a two. Got it. I see. So you made, you flipped two of them. That's okay. the mistake. Yeah. And unfortunately, you flipped two that were different colors from each other. Yep. Oh, well. That's good sleuthing. I think that this kind of project debugging, it's one of the hardest things to learn. So I think it's one of the most valuable things to offer up to a live audience like this. And also, uh, it's impossible to teach it, like without working through someone's active project. It's impossible to teach this in the abstract to be like, oh, well, when you have a problem, just use deductive reasoning to figure out what the problem is. But that's not so straightforward. Uh, and uh, you, saw, you saw us do it. It can be confusing. I'm also dyslexic, by the way. So. I, I mean, this is uh, this is the thing I always get terrified of when I'm doing these live streams of like, what if it all goes wrong? And then I eventually realize, wait, that's the fun part. Fun. <laughs> it's fun for the audience. <laughs> it can be fun. If you have a, a positive mindset about it, it can be really fun. Cause, but as soon as you start putting pressure on yourself and getting frustrated, then it's time to take a break. I think I think it just came with a, it really just came with the realization of like once the stream starts, it can't really go wrong. It can just slow you down a little bit. It can only go wrong if the if you like your internet goes down. That's right. the way I yeah. look at live streaming. It's like it's only broken if you're not online. It's not broken anything you yeah. do. Or Every, or if your audio is on the wrong frequency. That's yeah, the everything else here is just part of the show. All right. And, and also, like, you know, getting feedback from, from DigiKey, they're like, we really like it when things go wrong. I'm like, I hate it when things go wrong, but I see your point. <laughs> well, yeah, it shows the real-life problem-solving aspect of it. And um... Yeah, although here we've robbed the audience of the payoff of me uh, hopefully getting everything hooked up and being very pleased with myself and, and nothing being right. Uh, so there's that part of it. Here we, I'm we here to support you, Tyler. We won't let that happen. Here, here we noticed the problem before we got before we got too far into it. Okay, so the next but part. But even then, it's not the end of the world because, like, even if your those displays were mismatched, like you'd be able to fix 
you'd be able to fix any of it in code, but it just would be like a little bit of a headache. Right. Whereas it's less of a headache if we just sort it out and your code and you already pre-made your code, right? Yeah. Um, so, but we might, who knows, maybe we'll need to dig into there later and, and do some troubleshooting. The next thing I need to do is start making the big wire loom for, for this project. Um, and the cool thing, as you mentioned, the cool thing about I squared C is that you can run everything off of essentially a single wire or a single pin from your board, but I need to branch that. Um, so we're gonna, uh, first thing is we, we have our five volts or the, the voltage from the board. And so I need to take this and split it off into multiple branches so that then it can uh, reach all of the displays. And I almost wonder if I should start laying out this uh, piece of foam core so that I have all of the, uh, everything here kind of in its place so I don't make anything too short. Um, which is sort of be, well, just gotta do a bit of design work here and and lay everything out, and then cut holes in this board. Uh, I like your Ben Frodo magic arm, Tyler. This is, uh, that's hot recommendation from our, our good friend, and now, once again, regular make contributor, Donald Bell. Donald Bell got it from me. It was a facetious comment. Oh. Uh, I had a feeling that's where that was coming from. Uh, good call, good yeah. call. I've been using a magic arm since Donald Bell was in diapers. That's not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> I I was a, I claim I claim to be using the magic arm as a maker scene the longest. It's like only, I don't have very many um, claims that I will proudly stand on top of. But well, it's fantastic. So yeah, I thank never you for popularizing it. Um, I never really thought that it would. I, I mean, I knew that they were good, but my uh, I mean, we use these uh, Canon C one hundreds here in our studio, and and I never thought it would actually be strong enough to hold one of those up. So uh, and it's. It's a little wobbly for them. You, you notice when I like make little uh, focus adjustments, it has a little bit of shake to it. But um, yeah, man, these things are great. Use them. It's awesome for the hands in. Hands in shot is what it's. Yeah. Not top down, hands in. Yep. Um, <laughs> okay. What's the um, tripod uh, foot? The tripod mount, or sorry, uh, what's it called plate? The tripod plate mount on it. Yeah. That I can swap out cameras. And um, Becky, you'll be happy to know that Donald Bell is watching on the uh, Facebook. Oh, he is. I found it opening a different tab. Hi, Donald. That's and, great. And he is giving you all the credit. Ah, oh, good. Donald Bell is so, is so sweet. I'm yeah. just the person who doesn't know. Uh, I need to grab a pencil so I can do my layout marks here really quick. Uh, I'm going to run and do that. Okay. So, Becky, uh, I noticed this. you're using ESP8266 for this project. You've got on your... Um, on your instructable page, I think you've got three or four ESP8266 projects. Uh, if you count the, uh, the, the, the YouTube stats counter, the other social stats counter, you've got your weather tracker and uh, a moisture meter uh, that is powered by ESP8266. That is true. Good sleuthing. I wouldn't have been able to tell you how many on the top of my head that I have made lately, and I think you got them all. Yeah. I really love that little Node MCU board because it's so um, inexpensive and uh, like when I want to use, like for the first one that I made or this YouTube subscriber counter, I used the Adafruit Huzzah, Feather Huzzah because it, uh, they make a feather wing accessory that I could just plop right on top and it was actually way le way easier for beginners if you didn't have to even figure out which pins are the ice cream pins, you just put the whole thing in. But if I'm doing anything, um, that it's a little bit more expensive. So the Node MCU board is a way to get the ESP8266 functionality. It has a little bit of a different pin pin layout and it doesn't have the live poly charger. So uh, when I wanna put a, a project that just hangs on the wall, I don't need that extra battery circuitry to be paying for. So um, it's nice to use the Node MCU board uh, for stuff that I'm gonna leave plugged in all the time. But yeah, I did um, these two social chat checker. I did a, a soil moisture meter, which was for my solar power class on the Instructables website. If you go to instructables.com slash classes, I wrote a couple electronics classes there, Arduino, Internet of Things, using the ESP8266 and uh, solar. And so the solar class uses, it's an example of like an outdoor solar powered microcontroller project. And you could really change out the soil moisture sensor for any kind of sensor you wanted, uh, whether you're to you, like track the birds at your bird feeder or uh, do any other kind of weather monitoring that 
the project gives you a good template for it. So there's a tutorial there on my Instructables site. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got you, you've got quite a quite an Instructables page. You've got a lot of a lot of content uploaded there. But now you're uh, you, that's that's one of your main roles is uh, content creator with Instructables. Yes. I'm, I just got promoted. I'm product manager and content creator now, so that's exciting. Where I get to, uh, I'm working on some Tinkercad Arduino lessons. If you didn't know, Tinkercad now has a circuits editor inside. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be uh, circuits.io, and it's gone through a couple different Autodesk product iterations. And so I'm working on some Arduino curriculum using that circuit simulator, which is really cool because it's, it's kind of like fritzing in that you can make diagrams, uh, but it's also a, every part is simulatable. So you can like design your whole project, including the code, watch it run, and then build it from your own diagram. So that's a pretty cool thing that you won't see on my Instructables page because I'm publishing them on the Tinkercad Circuits Instructables page uh -huh. and linking to them frequently. Um, and you can also embed those circuits uh, like simulations inside your own tutorials so you can use it as a teaching tool and documentation for your own projects. It's really cool well. the, the way they've expanded that. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a Tinkercad fan, and uh, you know, I, I think that it's such a great gateway tool. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's so accessible for just so many, um, a range of makers, from, from young to old, you know, from new to, hey, I'm a pretty experienced, but I just need something really fast. To... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. What are you up to, Tyler? What's that? Oh yeah, switch over. Let's see. Uh, let's show oh. everyone what 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 you're cooking over here. Oh, I'm just uh, I'm just doing a whole bunch of measuring and marking here. Uh, I don't even know if I have the really good. I have this nice uh, macro lens. Oh, that's right. We're sitting on Becky here. Um, no, I'm just uh, marking I'm that because I get this. Show producing over here. I can see. I have the show open in another tab. I can yeah. tell when. Just, just, run. just call the show from here like you used to. That's fine. <laughs> um, no, I'm just uh, doing the, the markup and, and layout here and, and measuring all that spots for um, uh, for the, the holes I need to cut out for the displays. And um, just as a way of getting everything kind of laid out. And... Brian reminded me, uh, Mike, of another ESP8266 project that I did that I forgot. There are actually two more that I remember now that he's pointing out an earlier one. Uh, besides the weather display, I also made an internet valentine. So it's like a telepresence thing where you each have the same device and they both activate the little hearts on each other. So you can have them, as long as they're connected to the internet, they'll make each other light up whenever you press the button. That's awesome. And then um, that was last, that was Valentine's Day 2017. And then, um, there was another one I scrolled past. Oh, I made a lamp controlled by my Amazon Echo. So I, I used an ESP8266 uh, feather hussar with the relay feather wing to power relay to control a vintage lamp that had this wooden base. And I carved out the base and put all the electronics inside so you couldn't see it. And then ran the FOMO ESP firmware on it that emulates, uh, at the time it was a Wemo device, now I think it emulates a Philips Hue device, but that makes it the setup in the app super straightforward so that it just looks like any other commercial IoT product when you go to set it up through the workflow in the app. So oh, that cool. was like Echo turn on my, turn on the light. Thanks, Brian. Again, Brian saves the day. Brian's like, you didn't list all of your, he knows my project, <laughs> my project like very better than I do at this point. <laughs> We made yeah. internet. Isn't the internet, the internet great? You like use somebody's code, and then that person is like, "Oh, hey, thanks for using my code." And then all of a sudden, you're friends, right. and like now we're real friends. It's great. That's awesome. I um, I've only had kind of one experience with like I made a project and I put it on Instructables, and then somebody else found it and made it better. And that was the um, uh, a time lapse panning device. And I, I didn't really understand hardware design or what like kind of resources people had for like building robotics or things like that. Uh, I basically built it out of garbage that I found in my garage. Um, and then somebody else found it and then put it together with a bunch of stuff from like Actobotics and things like that. I'm like, wait, that, that design is a lot better. Also, wait, you have my code running on your, your device. Like people actually want to use c code that I wrote? Why? <laughs> That was an alarming time for me. <laughs> That's an alarming realization for many makers, I think. It's like, 
getting over the idea that like you're just sharing it. Like you have to investigate your own motivations for sharing, right? And if you want to share, but then you're surprised when someone wants to consume what you have to share, then you got to reconcile that in, in your own time. It, I mean, it was never. <laughs> it was never like, oh no, they're using my code. Like, like that I felt protective over it. It was more of, oh no, somebody's using my code. What disasters will it lead them to? Well, that's what I mean. Like, you, if you're going to put it out there, you have to assume somebody's going to want to read it. Yeah. Otherwise, why are you putting it out there? Um, but it was cool because then I have this project, and I ended up build, rebuilding his version of it with the better hardware design uh, for myself. I'm like, oh, this is so much better. And oh, great. I love that about the internet. Where because I like, I'm not that great of a coder, and it's awesome to be able to leverage other people, what other people consider fun and easy to do in their free time, like make Arduino libraries, and then uh, what I consider fun and easy to do in my free time, or you know, at work in my case, <laughs> to build build cool projects, and then to have this kind of uh, virtuous cycle happen where everybody adds a feature when they make their own version. I think it's so fun. Yeah, it's funny. I see that a bit with um, with people that we talk to about putting projects into Make Magazine, and uh, the stuff that's on the technical side. There is a skittishness about um, sharing code and being having programmed something for themselves versus for publication. And well, there is a big difference between code you'll write that just barely works and code you need to be able to answer questions about or have someone else understand without having written it. So people often say, oh, I'll publish it when I get a chance to you know, comment the code. And uh, it's better, I, I feel like it's almost better to publish early and often and then revise things. It's one of the reasons I really like publishing online versus in print is that like you can, somebody asks a question, you can be like, oh yeah, whoops. I, here's a comment. I, here's an answer to your question, and I improved it so that the next person who has that question will see the answer right in front of them in the sketch. But it's true that like you, you uh, the things that you're able to make are like at the very edge of your skills, right? And your ability to then teach that subject or relay that information to others depends on the domain. And electronics is one of those domain. Coding, especially, is one of those domains where. You can make it work, and you know how it works, but it's uh, not ready for someone else to easily grok how it works without further explanation. So it is an extra skill to be able to then share your code with others in a meaningful way, and it's uh, super useful. So yeah. Kudos to everybody who does it. All right. I've got the first one of these windows cut out, and now I get to, moment of truth, make sure I measured everything correctly. You didn't just trace around the display. That's what I would have done. I would have just traced around the display <laughs> and maybe used the ruler to make sure it was level. Yeah, I'm trying to like do a little bit of. I'm trying to, even though I'm not a designer, don't ever have me design anything for you. At least not like graphic design, but trying to like get good spacing, things like that. Oh sure. Yeah, yeah. I will. Yeah, I think what I would have probably done is marked the center of each and then eyeballed it and traced them all at once. If I'm, just, if I'm just sharing, I'm over here just sharing. Yeah. I'm also really good at overcomplicating things. So Does this you guys are missing some exciting cutting action right here. He's freehanding it. Don't don't say that when I'm still <laughs> cutting towards my hand. <laughs> Did you ever get that, that uh, did you miss out on the design school hand injury then that involves the, the knife and the ruler? Uh, no, but I see where this is going. <laughs> There's a very telltale f freshman design school injury that everybody gets when they do their 3D design homework at like two in the morning and they come in the next day with like their hand all bandaged up because they cut the corner of their finger off yeah. hanging over the edge of the ruler. Mm. And I always did my, I anticipated this and always did my 3D design homework during waking hours when I was not sleepy and only did homework with non-sharp tools at like 2 in the morning, which is why I got a B in drawing, but I never cut my finger in, in while I was in undergrad. I did it in grad school instead. <laughs> I mean... I was like, I was in some, uh, I was in a welding class because I was, uh, although I was in an MFA sculpture program, I hadn't taken sculpture undergrad, so I was learning how to weld and I was in a 
class of undergraduates who were ready to exhibit their work, and I was making name tags for our little exhibition. And I was like, let me show you how it's done, kids. You make the name tags with the, the utility knife and the ruler, and you the brand new sharp blade. And like, I didn't even notice I had cut the corner of my finger off until there was blood everywhere because oh, yeah. the blade was so sharp. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> well, here I am. We're about, with, to, we're about to see the wages of cutting freehand and trying to work quick. So uh, that's a bit of a chewed up thing here. We'll try to, we'll try to not, not do that in the future. Fine. Oh well, nothing a little gaff tape can't fix. Correct. Beautiful. Correct. Also, we'll have time to make a, a non-live broadcasted foam core cutout uh, for next week at Maker Faire. So if sure. it's not perfect now, that's a pretty easy thing to uh, rebuild. Yeah, we'll we'll pretend we'll have time to do that. Okay, so <laughs> that's one. Oh, I can look up the measurements. I'll bring you one. <laughs> um. We'll just knock out these other two. We're going to go with a one inch spacing between each of these. And Tyler, switch the camera over to this one. One of our one of our viewers is asking. They want to they want to see the action. Oh, they want to see they want to see my bad layout skills. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if I can get this sort of in place here. Uh, yeah. There's that. So just putting in a little mark on either side. This will be the top of the next row. And let's see, jog my memory here. These are one and five eighths tall. Yeah. I love your macro lens. I do too. Wait, did I say one and five eighths? That's correct. Yes. Yes, one and five eighths. Yeah, the, the macro lens is a little bit tricky to work with here because uh, this is where I really wish I'd also had that kind of wide lens that I have on the other camera here. Yeah, um, it's tough with the with the magic arm in a project of this scale. If you're doing a super tiny thing, the macro is great. Yeah, which is a lot of what I do with this lens is, is the tinier stuff, like showing all that soldering details. Um, but here I'm just going to put well, we're some... Seeing your, your very precise measuring detail, which is also very nice. Yeah. <laughs> just getting some part of what I'm doing in the camera frame. All right, so there is that. And I'm actually really surprised with how, uh, I just put a fresh blade into this the other day, um, but already I feel like I'm really dragging it. You gotta make multiple passes. Funcore also dulls the blades pretty easily, or has somebody been using your knife while you weren't looking? Uh, I hope not. That's your personal knife, right? It is. Funny if someone was stealing it out of your pocket and cutting stuff. I don't know. Foam core kind of it requires like the sharpest of sharp knives, and then in order to not make it get chewed, uh, multiple passes. Yeah, that's. I mean, I'm definitely doing multiple passes here. Maybe I'm digging a little bit deep on the second one while I'm getting through the the foam layers, yeah. and then a couple more passes to get through the the back half. My favorite knife is my Ulfa twist lock. Like it takes the whole strip of like box cutter blades, the break off kind. Mm -hmm. And when you tighten it down, it like clamps very tightly around the edge of the, the blade, like w near where the blade touches the work. So it keeps it nice and steady. Do you have, do you have that close by? I want to see I that. Do. Yeah, I do. As long as you don't cut to me while I'm not sitting at the bench. No, we're, uh... We're just watching Tyler's cutting skills here. Yeah. I mean, if you've spent any time around me in person, eventually I'll uh, wave this thing in front of you and tell you you should get one, because it's one of my favorite tools, the, uh, the Gerber. Oh, wait. Let's go over to it. I'm ready to show you my knife. It's not the Gerber knife. There it's it the Ulfa knife. Yeah. 
and it, it takes like the regular box cutter blades so it, so you can like snap them off when they get dull and then but if you keep it nice and short adjusted it this little ratchet clamp really tightens down very tight around the this area this is what differentiates it from like a two dollar box cutter where the this blade doesn't flop around so you get a really nice precise uh hold on it so that you can really dig down hard and then if it does get dull i just break off the tips of the of the blade so that's my favorite knife i've had it for 15 years and it's still holding up strong awesome yeah i came to this one a few years ago um uh this guy and i love it because it it folds up really tidily it goes like just fits in a coin pocket or something like that and then, you know, just has one of these standard utility blades, um, which means that I get to have a knife that I don't ever have to worry about sharpening, which means I right. get to be Right, you can just, like, turn the blade around when that first one gets dull and then replace it, right? Exactly. Um, you yeah, either flip it around or swap it out for a new one, because um, I, I don't have time to keep knives sharp. All right. So now we're on the back side here, just kind of evening everything up and... and And Becky, we were talking just before we went live uh, about Maker Fair. You're going to be there. I am going to be there. I'm speaking on a panel on Saturday at Maker Fair New York at 4 p.m. on the DIY Creator stage, and it's a panel about um, the future of online project sharing. And my colleague Audrey Love will be moderating, and uh, the other panelists will be Sophie Kravitz from Hackaday.io, Alex Glow from Hackster.io and Claire Whitmer from MakerShare. So all of the different platforms, sh sharing platforms will be represented and we'll be having a nice discussion about those and project sharing. That's a powerhouse lineup. That's it. Ev yeah. Everyone on that, on that panel is superstar. It's going to be good. But, you know, we're up against, like, at the same time slot as the Mythbusters Junior panel, which personally I'm pretty bummed to have to miss. But yeah. that's... Wait, no, that I don't think that's the case because, um, well, because I'm I'm all that also coincides with what I'm doing at Maker Fair, uh, which is running the uh, Maker Fair live stream, which is also graciously sponsored by DigiKey, uh, I should mention. But uh, I am I'm going to be featuring your panel and the MythBusters Junior panel, maybe and, um, and the MythBusters because that should be on Saturday at, at three p.m. Three. Okay, so what made me think that is I was talking to my friend Lenore Edmond, who's at Evil Med Scientist Laboratories, and she's doing a panel called Ask a Maker, and it's overlapping only 15 minutes with my panel. And so when she said, well, I was I was grouping our time slots together when I said about the Mythbusters one. Like I won't probably won't be able to make it to it. You know what I mean? Right. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> the same time ish, competing for the for a similar audience because some people might race from one to the other, but. Yeah, because I was. Um... Well, you're gonna race from one to the other, <laughs> <laughs> and also like, ah, uh, I you know, kudos to Maker Fair. But since when do they run on time by that time in the day? Um, I'm actually starting to to yell at people to keep their schedules on stage or keep their stage schedule schedules on schedule, um, because I've had some run-ins of like where one panel runs a little bit long. And then it goes over, and then uh, then I'm go, you know, say I'm because I my live broadcast goes from multiple stage or covers multiple stages, right. uh, and if I have one that runs long that I'm on right now, and I'm going to one that started early, I ran into this with Maker Fair New York last year where I missed almost entirely a talk from the Astromech Builders Club, and everybody's really upset, and that. I mean, I, I think that's bad for our live audience. It's bad for an in-person audience who's like, yeah, I want to see Astromex getting built, and that's going to be here at 4 o'clock. Well, yeah. oh, it happened at 3.30. So I'm uh, definitely putting pressure to keep keep the schedules on board. so that It's rough. I mean, I know it's hard to produce that event, so it, yeah. it's a lot of moving parts, but uh, I'll see you then. Yeah, I'm looking yes. forward to seeing both of you in person next week. I'm, I like that I don't have to travel, although it is a little bit far from my house. It's really nothing compared to <laughs> flying across the country. Yeah, wait a minute. Well, but I will point out that you folks generally stay much closer to the event grounds than I live. So there is that, that I have like the daily commute thing. 
yeah. or like getting yeah. out there it's like an hour. But to be honest, if it's not raining, I will ride a motorcycle. So it's pretty fun. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that um, done having do, been doing you know different kind of trade shows for a while. It it really does help to you know even even if you are on the other side of the country. Um, I mean, sometimes it's rough when you're doing a show like this, like going home and sleeping in your own bed and feeling like, because you, you, I don't know. Like even, even nice. in Bay Area, um, I tend to stay in a hotel, uh, even though my own home is not terribly far from there. Just because then when you're working like 18 hour days, uh, trying to act like a normal person to the other people you live with is, is tough. That's true. That's why I insist that all of the normal people I live with experience Maker Faire in a similarly intense capacity that I do. So we're just one team, one dream. Yeah, that works too. <laughs> but I got to come home and, you know, feed the dog. And I'm an old cat who needs uh, daily care. So it's easier for us that way. And, it, and it's uh, also a good opportunity to get some visitors like out to Brooklyn. I'm, the, I'm pretty close to the, uh, what you call it, the hackerspace, the NYC Resistor hackerspace that I'm a member of. So it's fun to be uh, closer to those other city events, be able to be a good host to uh, people who come in from out of town. I still need to visit that space at some point. Well, you're, if what, you know, your schedule permitting, I'm happy to show you around. Cool. Me too. Great. You yeah. don't have time. I already heard what your schedule is. You don't have time. <laughs> I'll make time. No, that's, that's, that's the type of thing that um, for those the, the day before Maker Faire, or the day to a couple days. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's the that's a perfect thing that I would love to schedule. Yeah, well, I could host. I mean, I have a flexible schedule. I could host you any time. That's not. You said you're busy in the evening, but I could do daytime. Yeah, yeah. Sabrina came uh, when she visited not too long ago. She vi I was out of town, but she visited the hackerspace. I remember seeing it on the mailing list. Cool. All right. No, not quite ready to flip that over yet. Get it. So Dave Darko is saying in the comments here that he was there last year at Maker Faire New York. It was super hot. Reminds everyone to bring water, which is um, just not not a bad suggestion. Although I've been watching the weather and it looks like it's not going to be as uh, as scorching as last we'll year. We'll see. I mean, it depends. Right now we're having some really cool weather because we have this big hurricane hovering off or you know slowly moving off the coast. Right. So it's been rainy for like a whole week it's dropped the temperature quite significantly we were having some really oppressive heat and humidity but you never know the end of september can be jacket weather and it can also be 85 90 degrees depending on uh, what weather systems are coming in so i would but definitely like plan to stay hydrated anyway because you're doing a lot of footwork yeah yeah for sure talking too. you're going to be doing a lot of talking if you go to make repair and uh that makes you get parched yeah, last last year was crazy hot. But there is a water fountain. I like the water fountain on the ground floor of Nice. I though the water is very cold. It comes out of the water fountain. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're anomalously cold because the year before that it was yeah. like cold and rainy all weekend. Which yes, it can also do that. It could also rain all weekend, which is in the fall not so bad by me. Like I like the cooler weather. I don't mind a little moisture, but it's not so nice for everybody exhibiting because then everybody has to worry about. Their outdoor things getting wet. Yeah, yeah. Not, not so good for video gear. I, I right, know. right, or for attendance. Well, fewer people will come. Yeah, all right. So there's all of our panels for the displays. And again, let's see if I can mash everything in here. And those are my two yellows. We're not going to worry about. Maybe I should worry about ordering them because then I might just solder these in place. And I need to remember. So I'm pushing them in from the back side. Okay, so one goes on the right side. Dave says that this weekend is Maker Faire Hanover, the biggest and probably the biggest one in Germany. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, one of the ones I haven't been to yet, but it's produced by our uh, our German partners. Um, like it'll make. Dot D E. Yep. Excellent. Oh, those folks. Oh, way back. Yeah, and the the from the Heiser team for the the C T uh, publishers. Cool. Uh, Show me that again, Tyler. Did you put them in upside down? Um. One of them upside down. The decimal point needs to be where there's the single decimal point that needs to be facing down. Okay. Um, I was wondering about that because the the silk screen on the back 
um, is right side up in this case, but that decimal point does make a lot more sense on the bottom. No? Good things to learn now, although that would have been fine, we wouldn't have known it until, um, but good to get that ahead of time. That should make wire, the wiring layout a little bit easier too, although now I've reversed them, I think so. Yeah, I mean, mine, the backpacks, obviously I'm using a different backpack uh, product than you. I don't remember if mine were that way or the other way around. I will look at my tutorial photos and see if there are any clues. I mean, we'll... Oh, we'll... my logo is sideways. There is no, there's no up-down. The up-down is 90 degrees, so there was no similar thing going on in mine. Yeah. Um, well, there's one way to find out. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's uh, start wiring these up. Um, so, still got our soldering iron going. Um, you don't have any female to female hitters? Um, I probably do. Okay, so that's one. These are reversed. Okay, so. Put panel one there and two here. MKME Lab says that there's an Ottawa Maker Fair happening on the 29th. That's the oh, one right. after New York. Yeah. As is the uh, the Milwaukee Maker Fair. It's oh, that's right. Kirby stuff with Kirby is is mentioned that too. <sighs> There's a cool. lot. It's a, it's, a, it's a busy time of the year for yeah. Maker yeah. Fair. Well, fall. I mean, the weather's nice, right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of good shows out there. It's great how many have developed and really turned into big events. All right. So the next part of this is I'm just going to make solder connections for basically all the different displays. Um, and then worry about wiring them all together. And I also have just noticed that I am uh, I seem to be working with stranded wire, which I don't think is what I ordered, but it's what I got. That might make this a little bit more fussy to work with, but that's OK. It's a little fussier to solder. you got to make sure you get all of the strands in so that they don't wiggle around and short out with each other. But the upside of stranded wire in your finished product is that it'll be less likely to break when you move it around, say, if you pack it in a suitcase or a box. Yeah. Because the what flexible, the stranded wire is more flexible. Or like me, where I crammed my wires so tightly inside a shadow box frame that like I wasn't looking at how the wires were getting smushed. I was just kind of like pressing and hoping that <laughs> everything stays. It's quite, it's quite full. I think I'm going to queue a couple of these up so I can just knock out all the solder connections for this one all at once. Heck yeah. Back work. Work smarter, not harder. Although, if you were really working the smartest, you would be, you'd just be plugging in female header wires <laughs> to this. But you know, then it, if it comes unplugged and the people at the, at the DigiKey booth can't fix it like that's a problem too so it's always um important to use the right method for the audience right like uh, my stuff if it comes apart i can easily fix it but if you're designing something for uh someone without the tools or the knowledge or both to use then you need to make some you know insurances that it's going to stay well this is working. where i uh, have really done myself a disservice because i'm going to be directing the live stream broadcast from the DigiKey booth right next door. So I'll be in the middle of my live stream and, you know, I don't know, David will probably come up to me and be like, hey, Tyler, our display stopped working. I'll be like, I, I will get to that. <laughs> well, you can, you can have them page me. I'll come over and fix it. Here we go. Or, or like anybody who's watching this stream who reads the tutorial and then comes to Maker Fair New York would also have the tools they would need to look up how to fix it anyway. And that person will get free tickets to Maker Fair next year. Yeah, right? Ooh. There we go. 
All right. No, um, it's gonna work the whole time. It's gonna be great. It's not gonna break mid nope. show. Nope. None of that will happen. Stranded wire, and you're soldering your connections. That didn't look like stranded wire, but maybe I can't. The part that's in focus now is not the. It's, it's not the yeah, wire. it's it's stranded. Um, I, was, I was reading the chat at the moment you inserted the wire. Yeah. Yeah, Brian says, find me out. I can help babysit the sign. We'd love to see you, Brian. Wait, Brian, are you coming to make a friend of yours? He's York? not. No, he's not. He's, just, he's, he's made a joke. Find me out, and I'll, and I'll help. OK, cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, someone asked what we're doing. To recap what we're doing, we're making a social stats tracker display that uh, uses daisy chained I squared C bus seven segment displays to show the social stats followers for three different accounts on the same display using one node MCU ESP8266 microcontroller. Yeah. Yeah, and Tyler's currently wiring the seven segment display. Do you know how much power those bigger ones use? Is it considerable? Um, that sounds like an excellent thing that I should have determined ahead of time. I'll look it up. Just like the really big ones, right? The one point two are they the one point two inch ones? Yes. Yeah. Okay. How much current do you use when all of your lights are on? That's not a, okay, that's all better. I may not say. I mean, of course, the power consumption varies depending on what is displaying on the screen. Be nice to know what the max current is. Because you're pulling the power through the uh, node MCU voltage regulator. Make sure it doesn't overload that. Seven segment displays are neat though. I mean, it is just one LED per segment and the lensing is what stretches out the lights. So I wonder how much more powerful the LEDs inside that giant one can be. That's a good point. Because they're not like one watt LEDs or anything. They're just, they're probably just regular. I don't know. I don't see any current on the official information, but We'll see. It'll either work or it won't. Yep. <laughs> and Brian, I mean, if it doesn't, you can always just hook up the, bypass the, the microcontroller's power and hook it up directly to the power source that the microcontroller is feeding off of. Yeah. Brian mentions, too, that it won't have all the lights on with the backpack. Exactly. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Can One, you imagine your display like on the wall and you're getting, oh my gosh, you're getting so many followers. Your display is getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> How much have, uh, have your follower counts changed since you built uh, these projects? Well, the first version of the YouTube subscriber button live display that I built was for under 10K. So. Uh, and I believe when I was building it, I think there's shots of 7,000. So I had 7,000 followers when I built that first one, and then YouTube has, got, has exceeded 20 recently for me, 20,000. So a lot. Um, that's my fastest growing network. And uh, Twitter, I thought, was going to breach 20 recently, but then that bot purge came, and I guess I had like a couple hundred bot followers. So Whoa. back a little bit on my YouTube, still at like 19.5. And then... Um, yeah, my Instructables follower account has gone up a lot because like people don't don't generally know that you can follow people on Instructables, so that's a thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just by making the tutorial about the social stats tracker, you get social stats increase because people are interested. People are inter more interested in those platforms. Are they going to follow you on those platforms? It's kind of it's very meta project in that way. That's right? funny. Well, shout out your uh, your channel names. I know you you tend to use. It's back, 
Oh, my screen, my handle online, I mean, you can just go like search Becky Stern on YouTube and you'll find me, but my handle online is Bekatwia, B-E-K-A-T-H-W-I-A. And you use that for almost all of your channels or all of them? It's never taken. You own it. I own it. It's on Twitter and YouTube and Instagram and oh, Instructables and wherever. Wherever I need a username, that's my username. That's good. It's my username. You, have, you don't have one? I've got I've got mine almost in every spot except for Instructables. For some reason, I didn't get. I just I just use my first initial last name. Very very corporate. Um, but for some reason, on Instructables, I couldn't get that. So I just for that one, I just did Mike JS. And, oh, I see. Yeah. Good old Mike JavaScript. That's me. <laughs> you should get Mike dot JS. That'd be good. I wonder if I. Could. That'd be good. You get people hitting you up for JavaScript jobs oh my though. God. I uh, I recently learned. An interest, a, a, a interesting lesson in not owning your username on every social channel. Oh yeah. Um, because on Twitter and Instagram, I post as at photoresistor. Oh, that's right. You have an electronics component username. But Trouble. not, but not on Reddit. Oh no. Yeah. And uh, somebody, the. You talked to Donald Bell about this. Yeah. At photoresistor on Reddit. Uh, made a threatening remark about our president. Oh no! And ended up with me having a lengthy discussion with uh, the Secret Service, who, weirdly enough, also work directly upstairs from us here in the office. Oh, what a weird coincidence. <laughs> or is it? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I was talking to, I found out that Donald Bell has at Donald on Twitter, so that's, that's rough he, for him. Yeah, he has different. Uh, experiences with that problems. yeah i do get uh becky stern's a pretty common name and although uh i do outrank them all on google sorry other becky stern's they're they are around and i do get emails for them sometimes from like their you know their great uncle sends around uh, how the potted flower is doing and writes my address instead of the real whatever becky stern but uh i try to wish the other ones a happy birthday on facebook because i think it looks funny when it's like becky stern writes on Becky Stern's wall, happy birthday. Yeah. Um, of course, the other fairly famous one of those is uh, Will Smith, um, formerly of Tested.com, uh, who has oh, at Will yeah. Smith yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, has voice as Adam Savage. Yeah, and, right. you know, sometimes uh, people yell at him when, like, I don't know, Jaden Smith is being weird. <laughs> I see. And what's my ordering here? Black, red, I'd... yellow, or green is my data connection, and yellow is my clock. Just got to keep that consistent across all six of these, because I do a whole lot of wiring. Mike, what were you saying about you think this one is going to go really quick? Oh, yeah. I think I say that every time. Yeah. Yeah. We, we try not to say that. No. I think I also started that sentence with, I'm going to jinx this. <laughs> this one feels like a fast one. I, th I think you did actually say that. So. It's going to feel like it went by so fast because we're having so much fun. No. It's, I agree. But it's true, because he doesn't have the header wires that you just plug into the display, it's, it's going to take an extra at least 10 minutes. Yeah. Becky, what new projects do you have underway right now? Mm, that's a tough question, isn't it? Um, it's summer still, so not a lot. I'm, I'm admittedly not a summer person. But um, I have a few, let's see, I, since you have me while I'm at my desk, I can actually pull up my projects brainstorming list and let you know what I have. Um, well, I wanted to for a while make a, a foot pedal connected to my door buzzer so that the dog can buzz the door. See, like when she's home alone, she's closed in a room, so she can't like, she wouldn't be like buzzing strangers in, but when, uh, I live in an apartment and when like the delivery guy, especially for like takeout food comes and buzzes the door, I have to get up, go over to the intercom and like press the buzzer button to like 
open the door downstairs for the delivery person to come inside and then wait there for the delivery person to come up the stairs. So if I can have the dog do that initial action of, she always comes to the door when the buzzer rings. So <laughs> I might as well have her train her to press on a pedal that then buzzes the door so that I only have to, I don't have to wait. I can just, it's a first world. It's the total uh, luxury niche product, right? I thought it would be pretty funny to make the video though. Yeah. Of the dog buzzing in the delivery, the food delivery guy. And she, I thought of it because she does come to the door whenever the doorbell rings. So, it, and she's very food motivated. So it would probably be pretty easy to get her to stomp on a pedal. So that's that's an idea I have. Um, it involves a little AC though. So I'm, I'm like hesitant because I have to open up the buzzer panel and the buzzer panel is AC. And I don't know if I want to add another feature to it. Anyway, it's just, it's on the brainstorming list. Um, <laughs> as many things, I'm sure you guys are familiar with projects oh, changing yeah. oh, as they Oh, yeah. go through the different phases of the brainstorming list. And there's some furniture projects I want to do around the house. I have some plywood left over from a um, furniture, a storage wall cabinet project that's almost done. So I want to use some of that plywood to make some like floating bedside shelves. Uh, I have a tutorial idea about teaching people loosely how to translate an idea into code. I think could be a useful tutorial to write, but that's not like a project that I want to build. It's a thing I want to teach. Um, just like a mindset thing. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. There's a couple of other silly things on here. That kind of sounds a little bit like the kind of mindset you get into your first year of like learning any programming, which is you just find yourself taking everything you do day to day and then just turning it into repeatable steps. Like, how do you make breakfast? Well, exactly. Like, if you had to teach someone how to make breakfast, but you only could do it in text, like, what? sort of uh, techniques would you use. And I think it's useful. I teach a class in the fall semester at SVA in this program called Products of Design. It's a graduate uh, graduate program in product design. And I teach my students Arduino and some fabrication stuff. We do some craft, like soft materials projects. And uh, hardly any of them ever have any coding experience. And so that idea came from teaching them uh, about like how to so you have an idea for a project. How do you actually break it down into uh, the code you have to write in order to make it go? And because I feel like that's often one of the hardest things for people to conceptualize when they're a beginner and really overwhelmed by the idea of writing their own code. Oh. Um, let's see. I, my list is really silly. Waxed canvas something. Like that's what gets put on my list. Like, oh, I want to make something with waxed canvas. <laughs> Just waxed canvas something. Something. That's what it says. Waxed canvas something. <laughs> Is it, um, is it, I think I've heard, I mean, were you going to be working with canvas that is already waxed or, because I think I've heard of some people doing processes of tackling that yourself and it's not that hard, but I could just be I making know, that that's up. that's why I want to do it. And no, I was going to wax it after and I do have the wax. So okay. you sew it up, you sew up a canvas thing and then you melt the wax onto it. A certain type of wax? Canvas wax. Canvas wax. Okay. Yes. For waxing your canvas. That's right. I guess, yeah. I mean, so I just, yeah, I got the idea when I saw uh, one of my colleagues did a wax canvas project. I think it was Mike, um, Mike Warren. And uh, I was like, oh, that's right. Waxing canvas is a thing you can do. And I like sewing and I like motorcycle stuff. And a lot of motorcycle accessories, if they're not leather, they're made from wax canvas. And I thought, I never thought about it before how it gets made, but it, it it's just sewing regular canvas and then waxing the final product. Of course, you can make things with pre wax canvas, but um, and the waxing kind of helps to wa make the thing water resistant, especially the seams. And like, I just had never thought about it before. And uh, sewing with heavy materials is, is also intimidating, but if you can sew with a softer material and then make it heavy later with this waxing process, right. yeah. that seems pretty cool to me. So I think I maybe like wanted to make a motorcycle tool roll or uh, something, something along those lines. Yeah, I've got a, uh, a idea in my mind for a vinyl, like a billboard material vinyl uh, tote project that I want to do, and that the sewing part of it's the part that I'm nervous about. My sewing skills are terrible. A heavy duty machine, yeah. yeah, right. But you're, you're, you're giving me an idea. About how many layers at, at the maximum? How many layers are you gonna be sewing together, and like possibly like four or five if you are like right. creating rolled over seams. Yeah, and that's that. You know, that's my dream. I don't, you know, I'm sure it's gonna look more like <laughs> dental floss and two pieces of uh, of of paper just sort of shoddily 
crushed together. But you know, in my mind, it looks as I've got this professional idea. It's yeah, be, well, of course, and, and that you're setting yourself up for a letdown if you're in your mind, you have a professional vision of it and you have never used like an industrial. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, just even a regular sewing machine, I'm terrible with. So, yeah, yeah. start with I would start with a um, like a prototype and a softer fabric to get your pattern making skills down. Yeah. That's proper advice for any sewing project, though. So I might go canvas and I might go then some wax. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You can make it wax canvas. Yeah, you're giving me an yeah. idea. Nice. Oh, my friend Norman Morales is in the chat. He's from the 330 Ohms makerspace in um, Mexico City. Mm. Hi. Hi, Norman. Thanks. Excellent. Hey, Norman. And I was going to say, uh, you were mentioning Mike Warren. I just got a copy of his new book. Cut in Hand? Yeah. Cool. Which, relating to um, motorcycles, my ex-motorcycle helmet is in that book. Oh, really? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he was, um, he helped us. I had a, I needed to do um, a video, or I, I was, it was a video I did about how to do um, uh, thread tapping. And I wanted to get a cross section of like what the different styles of taps looks like and the type of threads they form. And I'm like, I think we could probably do this on a water jet if Mike could bother cutting it for us on his water jet, and that was the bait. I was like, I'm going to bring you stuff to <laughs> cut in half. Right. That yeah, book's fantastic. Pretty yeah. awesome, exactly. It's a book of everything cut in half on the water jet cutter. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, with motorcycle helmets, you eventually have to retire them after a while, because that after about five years, the, uh, the foam that is, you know, basically a, a cushioning material starts to deteriorate. And or if you drop it. I dropped my, my secondary motorcycle helmet the other day, and I'm like, crap, well, that's it. Oh. Done. Like, can't wear it again after you. I'm not going to put my nephew in this helmet that might have a giant crack in it under the surface. Exactly. So, so I'm going to get rid of it. Where do you, do you know how to recycle a motorcycle helmet once it's done? The common thing that I always hear about is that you can donate them to fire departments. Um, they like, basically they love them because they can use them as practice objects for you know removing them from trauma victims and things like that. So that's that's okay. what I always hear is a, not every fire station will accept them, but you could probably call them call your local up and they will tell you which ones do. Uh, nice. In this that's case, a cool, it was a it, cool tip. It was a cool and easy way to do something interesting with my ex helmet uh, that I because like. The one that regularly accepts them here in the Bay Area is like pretty deep in the East Bay, and uh, you know one where I'd want to queue up a bunch of them to take them out there. Sure. Um, and I'm still overdue for something like that, but in the meantime. That's how I about the e-waste. That's how I get to hoard the e-waste. It's like, well, I'm going to take it all at once. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to the e-waste recycling facility, which we have a really good one in Brooklyn, by the way. Uh, run by the Lower East Side Ecology Center, the Gowanus E-Waste Warehouse, in case anyone's local and wants to uh, earn in some e-waste. The place is awesome. Or, or buy some e-waste. They have some, um, they have a store where they put, uh, where they'll like fix stuff up and they'll sell. You can get like a Nintendo classic there and like all kinds of old stuff that they made working again. Yeah, it's kind of like our, um, the San Francisco Waste management ha thing has a. I mean, I imagine most cities probably do, but they have an artist in residence program um, where you can oh, just show up there and make make art out of trash. And that is yeah. making my hoarder tendencies start to tingle. <laughs> I might have to uh, put that on my 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 pre Maker Fair tour list. The Gowanus E Waste yeah. Warehouse. Pretty cool. Yeah. Close to the hyperspace, walking distance. Oh, okay, of course. Perfect. Well, then it's definitely I mean, going on my top. From the, we have an e-waste czar at the hyperspace, and, and he takes like a hand truck. No car required. I mean, it's a bit of a schlep. It's only a couple blocks. Though. It's a bit of a schlep when you have a bunch of CRT monitors. You know, I gave my students, we started class again this year. SVA started class right after Labor Day. So I've, I've had two classes now with my new students. And our first project is a teardown where they they take something apart and they photograph the insides and they learn about different manufacturing processes. And I tell them, every year I tell them like, just don't take apart a CRT monitor because it's dangerous. And like this year for the first time, like hardly anyone knew what a CRT monitor even was. Oh, that's funny. 
and showed them a picture. They're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and then you showed them like the YouTube kids react to CRT monitors. There's one of those. Uh, maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a kids react to pretty much everything, so it wouldn't surprise me. It's like finding a uh, a payphone that's still functional and listening to the 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 uh, the dial tone. Oh, that's, dial tone. Yeah. I remember that. I would love I would love to uh, let my nephews experience the sound of that. They've probably never heard it. Similar, I, I, a friend of ours and a friend of make, uh, Jen Herkenroder. Um, Hi, Jen. Uh, she's watching. Oh, she is. Hi, Jen. Uh, I know that she's been messing around with um, doing research into um, uh, dial-based, or, you know, the, the rotary dial phones. And I remember when I first used one, I played around with If you keep pressing the hook switch, uh, you can basically emulate the um, it's like the rotary dial when you when you rotate it, I think it basically breaks the same circuit that the the hook switch does. And I eventually learned that if you just like if you want to dial a seven, you could either hit seven on the rotary dial, or you can just tap the hook switch seven times. I one time laboriously dialed up a friend of mine's phone number, and actually got it to go through. I don't know if that's true of all rotary phones, but the one I think that, I, I think spent, it is all my time on growing up would do that. Did, does anyone know if that if those still work? If I plugged in a rotary phone? Yeah. Work. yeah. I mean, yeah. Is, phones still work the same way. But landline phones, if you you just have to have a landline service, which is the thing that's well, going yeah, on. Yeah. Who's got that anymore? Yeah. Well, and also, I guess a lot of cable ISPs are offering uh, digital phones. So if your phone is through your cable provider, you're not going to get you're yeah. not going to get that. I doubt that your rotary phone would work without some kind of deal in a bubber. But if you got a regular landline, it'll definitely work. Yeah, and that was my thought. You know, with with the TV signals, all the uh, over the air stuff going digital and just making everything obsolete. I guess I figured we would have heard about it kind of like DTV. Probably would have. Where they're announcing it for years beforehand and teaching everyone how to make their own DTV antennas. Right, yeah. yeah. And you figure, you know, all the grandparents out there that still insist on using rotary phones, if, if that's even, if there are well, any I mean, of them at this point. Well, I mean, Wells' annual income is from charging old people $10 a month for their email address, you know? So it's like, mm, the TVs come with DTV's antennas in them now, so. Right. But right. it's true that kid, kids these days, uh, they both won't get off my lawn and also will never experience uh, TV static. Yeah. Which al always surprises me whenever I see anything that uses TV static as like, um, I know that like, I think Netflix sometimes. Like the HBO, HBO uh, yeah. uh, still uses TV static. Yeah, or YouTube for like their graphic for, hey, this video is offline is uh, like very understated dark gray static display. I'm like, why? This is video of static, it's not real static. Right. <laughs> There's a similar thing with the, uh, some of the AM news radio uh, channels where they'll, they'll have the, um, the live report from the newsroom, uh, little, little break, little updates, and you hear this background noise of typewriters furiously you know it's it sounds you know you listen to it you go wow this is like the news is bustling in this in this news office right now and then you know if you think about it you, know, you go wait nobody's using typewriters it's the, the a news office at this point is just silence people quietly typing on quiet laptops and um you know if you have to make a phone call you go outside and you do that uh, separately but they definitely not Yacking on loud typewriters. No. You think it would be to make it seem sound busy? Yeah, no, they just create this, uh, the, you know, the, the, it's just ambiance that kind of creates that busyness. And, and it, you know, and it harkens to the, that, that image of a busy newsroom with teletype yeah. machines and typewriters and everything, you know. Now, my dad worked in a newsroom. He's a newspaper writer at the Hartford Current for 25 years, 30 years, and uh, would bring me to work on Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. 
And I remember ordering Chinese food and it being loud. They were like mechanical keyboards, so like, but not everyone was typing. So it wasn't like, I don't know, there were a lot of people talking and there were a lot of news station, news TV stations on. That was what was loud. Right. It was like, CNN is on here and like, I miss, or whatever, the other one's on over here. And they're trying to watch them all at the same time and talking to each other. But the typing was mechanical keyboards. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you bring that sound back. Although I did spend one evening in a newsroom like that um, when I was working for CBS. And I was working for uh, a games division of there. And I was in New York um, covering like the PlayStation 4 announcement. And then coming back to this newsroom where like people were covering, oh, this like local plane crash. Uh, and I'm like, I'm just going to edit my video of the game console launch. Aww. You all keep doing your real news. Yeah. <laughs> but the the no. neat the neat thing about that is I ended up leaving that office at like two or three in the morning. It was a pretty pretty late night for me. Um, and then I walked past a, a one of the television studios there, and I think that a woman was just knocking out segments for like local news stuff for the morning, and she was just surrounded by robot cameras and reading off a teleprompter uh, through all these news stories. And uh, that would just probably be picked up for syndication in the morning. Uh, but that was a really neat thing to, to yeah. see. It's like, oh, that's how modern news looks. All right. I so, only know how vintage news looks. So that is four displays. Got two more to do. Yay. Powering along. Good, looking clean, man. Yeah. Nice solder connections. Not afraid of that macro lens. I get compliments for using my macro lens on solder connections because people call, people like Brian uh, comment things like, oh, you're so brave to show your soldering skills so close up because people are very judgmental of specifically that. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that was a, a joyful day for me in YouTube comments of somebody actually said, hey, nice soldering. I'm like, Yeah, hey. and you're like, wow. Because even if you're good at soldering, you still get lots of negative comments about your soldering, no matter what. I mean, you, uh, like the royal you, everyone. Yeah, just every, yeah. yeah. Tyler might make you feel Any good to know that. People who are yakking about soldering skills have never tried to solder themselves, or like don't know what it looks like. Because it looks kind of, it doesn't always look, I don't know. Yeah. I think it looks fun, but. It is fun. So Edward Hall on, uh, on the Facebook feed viewer, uh, he, he gave you a compliment. Aww. He said, I wish my soldering looked that good. It does look good. It does. It's all the macro lens making it look good. Yeah, right. Well, the macro lens doesn't let you hide anything. That's for sure. So like your soldering iron tip is really clean and you're applying good technique by heating up both the wire and the pad and then allowing the solder to flow and not getting it stuck to one or the other. So, you know, and macro lens is there to show off your excellent work. Um, I'm not usually one to advocate good tools. I mean, well, I, okay, that's not really true. But you can get a lot done with relatively meager tools, but getting your, getting your hands on a good soldering iron will, uh, especially when you're new at soldering, uh, will make a big difference in your confidence. Because um, I struggled with bad soldering irons for a really long time. And if you can get your hands on a good one, um, it's true that the, the tool quality in the soldering iron category m matters for your success as a beginner. Like the nicer soldering iron is easier to learn on because it will give you, you'll be able to tell uh, that the shortcomings are your own and not the tools. Yeah. And if you have a bad soldering iron, you're like, oh, is it me or is it just the soldering iron? And you won't know. Yeah. yeah. And again, the um, another recommendation for that engineering 01 I think that's what it's called the uh, the solder sucker because you will make a mistake with soldering um, but the other nice thing about using that one is that undoing your your mistakes doesn't feel like a punishment it just feels like okay here's the thing I need to do now and I have the tool that makes it easy to do yeah and that mindset is really important as a beginner I know because I teach these uh, grad students who have so much more self-doubt than even kids do because they know so much more about they, they know so much more about what to doubt about themselves I guess <laughs> I don't know but but they're so wrapped up in being good at it while they're learning that um, it is really important to 
be able to give yourself that success and know that getting the mindset of it not being a big deal to rework or change something, just like we fixed your display addressing earlier, it's like getting it right is the point. And it's never a straight line between it not being done and it being done. So it makes you feel like, I feel like that builds your confidence more than just going, following a tutorial and having everything work perfectly the first time. Being able to fix a mistake, I think, should boost your confidence more because at the end, you're like, wow, now I not only made something cool, but I also have the troubleshooting skills to be able to uh, jump into any situation and analyze it. And being able to make a mistake without a ton of friction to it. It's like, okay, I made a mistake. Oops. Undo. Not a big deal. Not the end of the world. Tyler, one question I've got. What is feeling your... increases though the more like spare parts you have in your lab, right? Like, the more projects you make and fail at, the easier it is to make and fail because you or have to rework stuff because you also have more tools, experience, and resources available to you for fixing the mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mike, you were about to ask a question. Uh, as we've been distracting you with our banter, I did notice. You've got these ones going in through the back, and then you switched to going in through the front. I, I noticed that too at one point. Will, and will it will it block the foam core? I can't imagine it will. I mean, I'm just going to be pressing this into the foam core itself. Um, I mean, some will be trailing out the back, and some will be fit, you know, coming out from underneath the board. But I think it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed myself doing that too, and and said, well, that's that's the thing I changed. On Facebook, D. Dodd asked how you recognize a good one. I'm assuming the, it's in reference to a good solder connection. And as Tyler solders these wires, I can explain. Um, the uh, heating evenly between the pad and the wire will allow the solder to flow evenly and make a good electrical connection to both components. And the way I can tell that it's good is that it is bright and shiny in color and round in consistency and looks like it has some surface tension against the wire and the pad. If it looks like a big, um, like convex bulb, like uh, like the, that Russian building with the bulb top, then you have to worry that it could be, uh, could have cooled as it approached that solder pad and not actually made a good electrical connection with it. So you're looking for like a smooth concave shape that, that swoops between the solder pad and the wire to sort of uh, show that the capillary action of the molten solder and the and the components made a nice even spread. And I can also tell in this technique of removing the solder and leaving the soldering iron for a moment after removing the solder uh, uh, ensures that that solder is going to flow throughout the joint uh, before removing the heat. It also makes it also allows you or avoids the problem of you take the soldering iron away and the solder wants to cool pretty quickly and then you have this leftover stick of solder stuck to your joint. And right, that's, that's that happening. Um, and I'll flip this over. The, the real aha technique for me was learning to heat, use the, the tip of the soldering iron to heat the joint, um, both the solder pad and the thing you want to solder to it and then touching your solder to basically the other side of it. So you're really using that, that you're only relying on the transfer of heat to melt the solder um, rather than the tip of the soldering iron. Because it's pretty common that you'll, you know, tip, you know, touch the tip of the soldering iron and then touch the solder to that. Um, but really all you might be doing is just melting the solder to the soldering iron, but not to the joint. Right, and occasionally uh, you can add more solder to a joint by touching it to the soldering iron tip, but that's a kind of only if you've got a molten flow going already uh, for it to join up with. You don't really want to apply solder with the soldering iron. No. Tyler should also be wearing eye protection while he's clipping these tiny wires, but it's not your eyes, dear viewer, that he's going to poke out with yeah. the flying wire. It's, it's just mics. No, that last, that last snip he made, I just watched it go dangerously close to now, his face. I really like, if I'm not wearing glasses, I will put my my other finger on it so that I can ensure that the bit of wire won't go flying while, uh, while it's clipped. Now, one thing I would really like to see if I was being a real stickler for this is I wouldn't mind seeing the solder flowing all the way through the joint and turning the other side of these solder pads silver. 
These are yeah. still the gold or copper, but I think I've got, I mean, I've got a good connection through, um, through the wire and and onto the solder pad. I yeah, in the standard wire, you can see how the stranded wire has bit. The capillary action has pulled the solder up onto this. I can see it a little bit on that side. Yeah, it's just not flowing all the way through and doing the same thing on the other side. Um, I'm sure if I just kept feeding solder in, it would eventually get that. But um, In the YouTube chat, Chris Lover asked two questions. Brian answered one of them. Uh, does the ESP8266 need a companion program running on the network or does it probe the social media sites directly? And it does probe the social media sites directly using the API. So that's what the code libraries that Brian wrote are really useful for is creating any uh, Arduino based program that needs to ping the social APIs for any reason. So you could you get just more than just a follower count. You can get like the current, the recent tweets or the, um, the number of people that I follow on Instagram or anything that the API can serve up. These Arduino API libraries that Brian wrote will um, will allow you to access directly from the ESP8266. And it's, it, it is connected to your local Wi-Fi network. So it basically is its own little thing pinging those APIs. And uh, the other question was, is there an update rate? What's the update rate? And the, uh, the APIs are rate limited. So like you can't ping it a bajillion times a second, but um, I can't remember. Well, when we get to the code, we can see how often the sample code was set to update. Like maybe once a minute, maybe once every five minutes. I think, Brian I think it is. It does feel like it's once a minute or so. I feel like the YouTube one that I have going separately is updating more frequently than that because I definitely see it kick up um, when, say, like I get. Uh, Say I did a collabor you know, I do a collaboration and I'm getting a lot of traffic and my followers are going up more than one a minute. I remember like the YouTube one I definitely have going faster, but the multi social tracker one I think I had it set to like whatever the most limiting API was. Yeah, and I have all of these being called in the well each 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 social media call has its own function in the code. And then I'm calling each one in the, the main loop of the code. So if any of those time limiting things are, are built into the functions, then I mean it'll all be slowed down by the slowest one. Well, I just think it won't. Uh, if you request it and you're rate limited on that API key, then it just won't give you the new number. Yeah. So it just won't update the, that one. Or maybe it would return zero. It depends. Although I, I did notice, because I finally got the code completely running this morning, I needed to get, um, for, the, uh, for the YouTube one, you need to get the channel ID, which if you have uh, what I'm going to call the vanity uh, channel name on YouTube, which DigiKey does, theirs is like just make, or youtube.com slash user slash DigiKey or something like that. If you don't have one of those, you get a long alphanumeric string that's your, your uh, channel ID. And that's what you actually need to put into this code. And I just got DigiKey's channel ID this morning, so I could plug it in. Uh, I was okay, doing that. I have to look it up for you. I was doing that in uh, our weekly editorial meeting, and I noticed as I was writing the code and looking at it, they gained. Well, I, I tested it out to be like I unsubscribed for their ch from their channel to see the number change, and then subscribed again. And then uh, as the meeting was going on, they gained two more subscribers. That's great. Way to go, yeah, it's, fun to watch. it's pretty motivational. I keep mine up on the wall, and like, it's true that when you measure things, they tend to improve. And while I'm not, uh, uh, like, I'm not hung up. I wouldn't say I'm hung up on my social media fame. It's uh, definitely a tool to visualize the impact that you have and the the community that you have too. Because we also like make things alone in our workshops a lot. So to have the idea that like a remi visual reminder that of how many other people are out there, like who want to participate in whatever you're working on in your workshop is kind of a cool, uh, uplifting reminder. But it's yeah, also feels yeah. really good to watch it tick up because like, it hardly ever ticks down. Oh, that would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for that Twitter bot clear out. But that happened like overnight, you know? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. The number's then different. Just, then you just wake up the next morning, you're like, wait, where, what did I well, say? Sorry, yeah. But I mean, when you watch it tick, like it usually is ticking up. So that's... <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, I got one more Instructables follower since we started the broadcast. <laughs> all right. Got those all punched in. 
last. Oh, uh, Dave is pointing out that if you pre-tin those wires, they might be easier to put through the holes. I it's true. Have, they also backfire if you put too much solder on them, then they become too fat to go through the holes. That is usually my experience with pre-tinning, and it was usually why I don't. <laughs> it's a matter of preference. If you if you can go uh, kind of uh, meager on the solder application, it's possible. And I've done that before with really, really fine stranded wire, but that the stranded wire you're using doesn't look like the most strands in the world. No, this is... Um, yeah, this is uh, I think it's like 22 gauge stranded wire. So if I get if I get any tinning on there, it is going to bulk up really fast. So just to recap, what have we done so far? We have assigned the six seven segment displays to the various addresses so that uh, each set of two represents a, a big digit number for each social network. So three numbers for three social networks, six, seven segment displays. So we already did the addressing and now you're soldering all of the data and power connections. Yep. And then the next part after this, uh, well, I'm going to lay everything out into the, um, into the foam core and hopefully I've got every, I'm not, I'm not going to glue anything down just yet because there's no guarantee that I have everything laid out correctly. Um, but after that, then I need to, basically seek or chain all of these together so they're all in the same circuit and wire them to the board and I've actually already got the code on the board so then I'll just fire it up and see if it starts to display stuff that's and good Brian was concerned earlier that you were gonna have that he wanted to remind you which version of the library you should be using in case he needed to go to bed so now Brian you know Tyler's all set um, <laughs> the code I know works um, yeah, exactly. I, I've, I've been, I, like I said, I had it um, running this morning in the, in the serial monitor and everything was displaying correctly. Okay. So now it's really just making sure that it's working, the display is okay. What and, kind of clippers are you using there? What's that? What kind of clippers are you using? These are the Hako ones, which are always surprise me when I buy them because I my experience with Hako is that that's the the good expensive stuff, but these are stupid cheap on on Amazon. I think they're like three bucks a piece, um, and they're they're really important to get because you can get relatively you know because the cutter. So we can show it here on camera. The I mean these are what what is referred to as flush cutters, where the blade is actually right here, so you can get right up next to uh, the PCB, almost to the point where you're almost afraid of scraping bits off of the PCB and get uh, a really nice uh, flush cut, a relatively smooth cut, um, which is what I'm trying to get here. Okay, so that's the last one of these together. And now I've got to make all these connections. Remember the order that these go in. So one is here on the left. Two is on the right. I'm just going to press these into place and then hold it up, and then you can see what this rat's nest I'm about to be daisy chained together is going to look like. in there. This is going to be kind of heavy when it's done. Those wires clear. This one's out of the way. Did you keep up the Node MCU? What's that? I'm assuming, I'm assuming yes, but did you get your Node MCU from DigiKey? Uh, yes. I've got everything. That's cool. That's news to me that they carry those. Yeah. Oh, come on. 
I remember when they discontinued the DigiKey catalog. It was big news. Oh, do they have like a big physical catalog? Yeah, famously big. Bigger than McMaster Car? Oh, much bigger. <gasps> like twice the McMaster catalog. Okay, so that's what we're looking at now. Yay! And here's what oh, it looks, looks like from the back. Oh, it looks even better on the back. <laughs> and now I've got to take all these connections and wire them together. Green to green, yellow to yellow, red to red, black to black. Yep, that's go, go, at, go. At least <laughs> I made my life a little bit easier with regards to um, that. And then now I've got to think about how I want to do this so that everything is going to be laid out well. This is where I wish I had a nice top-down camera, but I don't. We will make do. I know I have yet to find like a they just you know the the optics of macro is such that you you can't have a nice lens that's a zoom and both a really cherry macro and. Uh, medium frame it would be our dream wouldn't it it yeah yeah all right so basically what i'm doing is i'm just kind of chaining these together and then i'm going to well, here's what i really need to think about is i've got the top row red wires chained together, but then I need to connect them to the middle row and then the bottom row. So maybe I can just use this. They can um, all go together in one into one, four into one is okay. Yeah. Maybe that's what I should be doing. Do I have enough? Yeah, four into one. In which case, that makes it a little bit easier. Well, here it's going to be six into one. Oh, right. Sorry. Mine's four into one. Yours is six into one. Mine's extra nightmarish. Uh, yeah, well. Uh. <laughs> but you'll, what you should do is solder them to another wire and then use that wire to connect to the Node MCU so that you're not crowding the pins. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to basically chain them all, gang them together all into one. Let me, in, in fact, this is actually a place where I can bring the macro in and show yeah. you what I'm trying to accomplish here. And then pull a single wire off of that. Move that angle. single wire to go into the microcontroller board without any uh, space problems. Yeah. So that's my gang of so far three connections. You might need to trim some more insulation just to give you enough wire to twist as that fattens up. Yeah. That might be I a good watching, idea. I love going over um, suspension bridges and looking at their giant cables because it reminds me of stranded wire, but it's just bigger. Or like, or vice versa, or like when I'm twisting together stranded wire like that, it reminds me of a bridge. Right, yeah. Yeah, maybe knocking this, you know, getting a little bit more strand here is the right call. A little more strand for your buck. Mike, are you host, helping to host the live stream at Maker Fair next week? I will be taking some turns on the live stream, yeah. yeah it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, I, I actually find it to be one of the, um, one of the cooler ways to experience Maker Faire because you kind of get, you, you know, you... Well, you get to butt in front of everyone, that yeah. is for sure. The official live stream coming through right. and like... Yeah. <laughs> you Cut to the front of the line, in, right. In the back of a crowd of people waiting for your turn to see a booth. Right. And then you also, you know, you can... You can you kind of have to run through things, you know. You yeah. keep it keep it moving, keep it moving. So you, it's 
uh, I actually find that I knock out a lot of the uh, the exhibits a lot more doing the live stream than I do just regularly because I kind of have to. Um, right, because you're imagining it for another audience too, yeah, and you're yeah. curating it for them, so you get to, and then, so the end result is that you have a lot of people to maybe follow up with afterwards for a longer conversation, but you uh, get through a lot more material. Okay, so there's my solder nightmare. Um, it looks great. Put a little heat shrink on it. Nobody will know. Yeah. Well, I mean, my biggest concern now is just making sure that uh, I can get enough heat in there that I can get everything connected nicely. That's where having a nice soldering iron comes in handy, too, because the when you talk about having a nice soldering iron, really the important part that is nice is the power supply, right? Because yeah. you want it to be able to deliver a lot of heat quickly and not an, uh, be able to compensate for a loss of heat quickly. And so if you're attaching, touching it to that big thermal mass, it's going to dip the temperature of the soldering iron pretty uh, dramatically. And you have to have a soldering iron's power supply that can keep up with that demand in order to keep the heat coming. And not, uh, if you look at like the graph of the temperature, it should be as consistent as possible. So like the tip being dirty is one thing, but if you have a power supply that can't bring the heat, you're never going to get good performance out of it. Speaking of dirty tips. That's pretty well explained. Thanks, Becky. So that my friend Sion, the unexpected maker, has joined us in the chat. Hello, Sion. From, where's he from? Australia? What time is it there? All right, so I am starting to get enough heat into this joint that I can just and then man crafting. I subscribe to man crafting on YouTube. Hello. That yep. is tied fingers. Yep. Soldering the wires. Yes. It is. Hello, Chad. Chad is man. Chad is Chad for man crafting. I am getting a good bit of the Are old. Are you coming to Chad from man crafting? We've never met. That's my understanding. I met him at Maker Faire New York last year. Okay. I assume because he's woot wooting it being uh, one week from now that he's coming. 11 a.m. in Australia. Good morning. Wow. But tomorrow. Yeah, I know. He's, he's talking to us from the future. All right. I think that's good. So watching this as we as we twist this and uh, and, and solder it together, um, I've got a question for you guys as more of electronics experts than I am. Uh, it's it looks like when I work on a lamp project in my house, a little you know if I'm doing some home renovation something, and I use those the twist wi lock wire the wire nuts, nuts? yeah. Wire nuts. Uh, why not use those for something like this? That's my question. Um, you certainly could. I I don't know that um, wire nuts are. I don't know what it. Wire nuts always weird me out. It, it does. It always feels like, especially for high voltage connections, which is what you usually well, use them for. They they're always, just high voltage because the it's the per connections not they're insulating per, first of all. So in that way, they act like uh, heat. Uh, heat shrink tubing or electrical tape, but they have a conductor inside them. So they're helping to make the connection besides just holding the pinched wire together. But the, for high, I always considered them uh, good for something that was gonna to be inside a wall and no one was ever gonna flex the connection. Because if you flex the connection, it can come undone. But for high voltage stuff, say that the wires are dirty, the high voltage is gonna be able to bridge the, the less than perfect connection more easily when we're talking about house current, we're talking about one one ten volts is going to be able to bridge over a, a somewhat oxidized connection more easily than a low, a, like a direct current low current or sorry direct current low voltage situation. So I would say you wouldn't want to use them because they're not as electrically connective as solder. Um, and the reason that uh, and soldering is used in house wiring. My grandpa and my uncle are actually electricians. And uh, that, that high voltage-ness uh, of house wiring can help make wire nuts a feasible solution. But they're also clunky and big. So the reason people don't use them for electronics, small electronics projects, is just because they get in the way. 
uh, and there's more, we're all driving towards small, and so soldering is a way to make your circuits a little more tidy and compact. Yeah. But it's true, is there is no reason you couldn't use wire nuts for a project like this. Um, just, I would recommend then keeping the, all the wires like inside a case inside the back of that thing so that they're never being pushed around. Yeah, because, because movement will cause wire nuts to come disconnected. Yeah, generally with wire nuts, you once you have everything wired up, you shove the whole thing in a junction box, and assuming that you haven't jostled anything loose through that, it shouldn't go anywhere. Exactly. Oh, good tips. But also, the wires are dirty, it doesn't matter as much, because 110 volts is going to create an electrical arc between a lot more dirt than a 5 volt signal. Okay, so now we've got our connection for ground and yeah stripping off a bit more and then twisting them all together made that look a little bit tidier um, don't forget to switch you can see that there there it is so maybe this will even solder together a little bit easier we'll know soon and of course once this is done then I'm gonna get some heat, sh heat shrink on all this although I think some of our larger diameter heat shrink is clear, so I don't get to hide as many sins as I would like. <laughs> what sins? Your solder joints are perfectly fine. I mean, if, if anything, it's just your strategy that looks a little clunky, right? But it's fine to have all these wires into one. Yeah. Much less clunky than trying to solder that giant twisted thing onto the pins of your microcontroller. What kind of soldering iron are you using? Um, this is, well, I was recommend, it's a tough one to recommend, although it is one that I like a lot, um, because I say it's tough to recommend because it is the Radio Shack digital soldering station. Oh, tough to recommend because you can't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a bunch of these from when uh, we had a, a marketing deal with Radio Shack, and we had a couple of these kicking around. Um, yeah. But the neat thing about it if you do some research is um, it's I mean Radio Shack did not make the soldering iron of course there's a white label so you can find it somewhere yeah it's a German brand I know that um, yeah and it's a 60 watt digital soldering station and it works pretty nicely um, I like it a lot um, obviously people like to recommend the the Hako uh, digital soldering station. Um, Weller makes a really nice one. Yeah, my first soldering station was a Weller. It was great. Yeah. I have a Hako now. Where's your third hand tool? That's what I want to know for a solder joint like this. Uh, my third hand is uh, right off camera here, um, but these are. I mean, I'm dealing with wire stiffness enough that's kind of all wire. staying in place. So I'm not too worried about it. Sometimes I find that I'm able to apply more pressure. In a big solder joint like that, you really want to keep the soldering iron touching the joint consistently. And, and uh, sometimes I'm not able to put as much pressure uh, in order to make that happen unless the, um, the jaws are holding it really close. I will try that with um, this yellow wire, which is my I squared C clock connection. And we'll see, see where that gets us. That's two. Now this is starting to turn into a bit of a rat's nest. This is so different from how, I should probably get back off of the, uh, I'd originally envisioned like doing some fancy layout with this where I really wanted this thing to look exactly like, um, almost like a fritzing diagram of the wiring. Mm. Uh, this, is, this is not that. I sort of ran out of time with that design phase. It could be. Fritzing doesn't have to look tidy either. <laughs> But like, you can draw some lines from connection points. Have, but can you can you do four into one? I think you can as long as you like drag everything to a node point and then say, here you go, everything yeah, everything comes you can't into here. Base. That's true in Tinkercad circuits too. You can't terminate a wire in space. It has to be on a node. But you could overlap wires to make them look like they're all going into one at a point further upstream than they actually are. Yeah. All right. Let's 
gang all these together. And Becky, you've mentioned a couple times that you uh, you teach some classes at SVA. Do you want to tell everyone about uh, what, what is SVA? School of Visual Arts is an art school here in New York City. Um, it offers all kinds of undergraduate and graduate programs. Um, I went to I went to a rival school for undergrad uh, here in New York called Parsons School of Design. But um, the program that I teach in called Products of Design. So if you go to productsofdesign.sda.edu, you can find more about it. It's a, a grad product design program, and it's pr relatively new. This will be my sixth year teaching in the program and i'm an inaugural faculty or founding faculty like the i started teaching there at the program's inception with part of the program's like creation and uh so it's only 60 yeah five years old and um it's like 20 it's a two-year program and there's about 20 students in each year so there's like 40 students total and a lot of adjunct faculty in, in uh teaching I mean, I'm like the most, one of the most technical classes there is that a lot of like design strategies and um, yeah, teaching people to be like responsible future product designers who can now, you know, make physical prototypes of their product ideas with real electronics components. And even if they have to have like an Arduino board off to the side and wires running into their prototype for size constraints, uh, there's a lot of power in enabling designers to be able to visualize their ideas and really understand the um, that bridge between like physical world and digital world stuff when it comes to like designing physical objects or designing experiences uh, it's super useful so uh, I'm jealous of all this stuff my students get to do in their program they get to go on all kinds of crazy field trips to special places that people don't usually get access to and uh, study with some really awesome high profile folks um, myself notwithstanding and it's a uh, good yeah it's awesome it's a really fun experience for me and um, really fun to see what the students go off and do after they graduate too now that there are a couple of classes that have gone through the program that's really cool yeah um, well nice all right one more connection made and have green left right just green okay. slowly getting there the other camera here while I'm doing this wiring bit. I mean, you say it looks like a rat's nest, but in reality, if you had to do this project without those I squared C matrix backpacks, oh, it would be uh, even It would worse. be like, a, what's crazier than a rat's nest? Like a beaver dam? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it really would be crazy if you had to control each one of the LEDs in the seven segment display separately. So we're gaining a lot by using that, uh, I don't remember the number, the max chip on the back of that seven segment backpack. So like now, you know, back in my day, you had to walk to school back, uphill both ways in the snow, barefoot, and with no ice cream seat backpacks. Yep. All you had to do, your multiplexing all yourself. Yeah, exactly. All right. So it says me. I've like made a multiplexing LED circuit one time. And it was like 15 years ago. Get all these green wires together. Let's for them. Chad from Mancrafting is asking if didn't I make a social media counter? That is why I am on the show today, so that I can <laughs> walk Tyler through the build of my social media stats tracker counter display. Mm -hmm. Didn't you make it? Yes, it's on YouTube and it's on Instructables. So if you if you find the project, um, I don't know if there's a description for the yes, there's a description for the video and it does not have a link to the project in it. I can't put the link in the chat, but I can ask Mike to oh. put a link to it in the description of the video so that you can um, find your way to the tutorial if you would like to follow along and build one of these yourself. Yeah. And it will Clorox wipes asks, is that your real name? The one your mom gave you? Does it, yeah. does it work for uh, YouTube subscribers too? And the answer is yes. This, uh, Tyler is this building a, a, this is sort of a hybrid design. 
Right. My this so the stats tracker that the, the project tutorial is for is uh, the one I built is for Twitter, Instagram, and Instructables followers. But it's based off of a previous project I made that's just YouTube subscribers. So Tyler's combining the code for the two projects to uh, swap out one of the networks for the YouTube uh, subscriber count. But it's pretty easy. If you look at the social stats tracker tutorial, it's pretty easy to see how. If you look at the two tutorials, it's pretty easy to see how you would. Um, it's just like a separate line of code to call the Instructables API instead of the, or the yeah, call the YouTube API instead of the Instructables API. So you can kind of mix and match to your own uh, preferences. And I bet it, I, there's a Facebook API too that we haven't talked about and neither of these projects directly reference it, but there is a, another <clears throat> Facebook API you could use to grab your Facebook followers too if that's a network that's important to you. Yeah, there's, there is one gotcha I ran into when combining the two pieces of code. Mm -hmm. um, which is that um, there is a variable that he uses that gets passed into the libraries that, that Brian wrote. And in the YouTube one, you well, there's two flavors of them that you see, uh, two flavors of that variable that you see in the, the, the multi-strat tracker. That's called like uh, client and client secure. And in just the YouTube one, it just needs it needs the secure one, but the variable is just called like client. Oh, and okay. I ca yeah, I, yeah, YouTube wasn't um, working at first, although it wasn't giving me any uh, descriptive errors. And then I just said, oh, here it's called, you know, I noticed, um, anyhow, that was just one thing I just changed. Uh, Got it. The variable well, I think of. at a certain point he must have updated the some libraries to work on the secure connection and then maybe others didn't need it. And I don't know, could be a library update mismatch problem also. Where like he updated one library and not necessarily all of them. That's cool, good pro tip. I would love it if you would share your new your new code sketch. Uh, I, I should probably do that. Yeah, and, and when we get into the code, I can take a look at that, and because I'm I'm remembering that that catch from memory, which is always a really good technical tip. It's like I remembered this from like this code I bought together last week. I'm sure it's really fresh in my memory. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, but sometimes when something's frustrating, you can't forget it. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have that aha moment with it and you know that kind of cements it in your memory pretty well but still or you spend a lot of time yeah you spend a lot of time on it i remember uh i like i was having an adobe premiere problem at like a summer camp job in college i was a summer camp and uh i like i ruminated on it i couldn't figure out what the issue was and and like i actually uh had a a nightmare and ended up walking in my sleep and i figured out the problem while I was like walking in my sleep. Oh, wow. Messed up. But I woke up and had the answer. It was weird. <laughs> it was like a exporting the selection versus the whole sequence problem. I was exporting the select the sequence and the sequence was set to shorter than the whole project. Mm. Yeah, that'll, that'll get you. It took a stressful night of sleepwalking to figure it out, I guess. I only sleepwalk when I'm really stressed out. Handy Rhett wants to know what the link is to the code. Mike, are you putting a link to the project tutorial in the description of the video? I am working on that right now. Um, you, you said, I can't put it in the chat, but I could put it somewhere else. Let's see if, I just tried putting it in the chat, see if I've got it. Oh, you can put it in the chat. I'm not allowed. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Mike just put the link to the tutorial in the chat, so you can find it there. And then in that tutorial, there's also a link to the YouTube um, display that I made right in the first paragraph, so you'll be able to find both of the codes that Tyler's using for his. Thanks. Perfect. And I'll try to update the uh, description itself to put that uh, embed it right in the description. Uh, I'm going to be careful about doing it right now because I don't want to click the wrong We're, button and yeah, <laughs> kill the broadcast. Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah kill the broadcast. Yeah, no. let's not do that. All right. <laughs> so heat shrink tubing on our data connection. Next, we'll do the yellow, which is our clock. And we are running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to, well, hmm, how do I want to do this with the, the actual Node MCU board? 
maybe I should be smart and solder. solder these onto some female headers so I can just plug them onto the board. Let's do that. Let's take a oh, yeah, do that. And let's then plug not it right. Be into too the, lazy. You have the assembled one, right? You just plug it. In. Yeah, the one I have has the headers already soldered on. Otherwise, I just solder this straight onto the board. But I also want to figure out a way to like display the Node MCU. Um, yeah, so people can check it out. Um, but then, like, do I want to power it from the back so that I don't have like a USB cord hanging out the front? Um, I think these are decisions that I'll make off camera of how I want it. To, yeah, how to make yeah. it look pretty. We're gonna stick it, yeah. We're gonna make it look. We're gonna make it work on this, and then we're gonna make it all make it look pretty, and that way that people can see it if they come to New York, which they should. Or they, or they check you out on the live stream, or that maybe you'll post a picture of it on social media. Yeah, I'll do one or many of these things. Yeah, that's awesome. Somebody was asking about the cost of the build materials for this project, and the version that Tyler's making has bigger displays than the version I made, so it, the, those displays are are more expensive, uh, but I'm trying to remember. I want to say that this displays I'm using are like 20 bucks a piece, and I have six of them, so. 1750. So 1750 times six is just the displays, then the Node MCU board, and that's basically your total cost of parts right there. Yeah. And then mine, I use the smaller ones that are less, let's see. I want to say they're like eight dollars for the uh, backpack and the yeah oh they're nine ninety five yeah so and and mine since I don't have I'm not making I only used four seven second displays in mine because only um, only one of my social media networks had over ten thousand followers in in the display that I made so if you have fewer than ten thousand on any of those networks you can get away with just one of the um, segment of well, seven segment displays because they're they have four digits each. So if so, for if you only have one per, and they're ten dollars, and that's thirty, and then the the Node MCU is what like five. It's like thirty five bucks. Yeah, I think I, I end up, I always end up getting these in the two packs, which are like twelve bucks or something like that for the two of them. So. Right. So it's very the cost is variable, but we're looking at a min minimum of about thirty five and and upwards from there. Not bad. No, not too bad. Get this repositioned and focused before I hit it with the heat gun. I like the sound of your heat gun. Heat shrink tubing is one of those oddly satisfying uh, procedures. It, it's like a little bit of calm in your project struggle. All right. <laughs> um, this is where I'm going to make myself a little crazy because I have these um, female headers close to hand, but they're nowhere near the colors that I'm actually working with here. That's okay because you're just going to make little shorties. You'll still be able to see the wire color yeah. when you put them in. Yeah. We'll forgive you. Don't recommend this, but well, actually, no. I have green at least. I can match green. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, we'll pretend. It's worse if you if you have the same colors and you mismatch them than if you just use different colors. Yeah. Uh, there is red in purple, so we'll match purple to red. And you could do white for ground. I often do like white and black are both ground. That's that's a habit that I sometimes still do because the the very first like Arduino kit I ever got had no black jumper wires, um, so white was uh, white was ground. That's just how it went. In conventional elect electrician talk, white is usually the hot wire. White hot. Yeah, but that's electricians. It's true. I think red. Red is hot. I, and so when I'm out of when I'm out of the proper color wires, I use like the same color uh, color temperature. So it's like, oh well, if I don't have red, so I'll use orange. Or like, I don't have blue, so I'll use purple or green, yeah. something that's uh, like a warm color and a cool color for power and ground. That makes sense. It only works because I learned color before I learned electronics. If you don't know what a warm color is and a cool color is, that doesn't help you. And then trying to have that discussion between an artist 
and a scientist. I was trying to explain to my students uh, on, what was it, yesterday, that like the color of the wire does not have an impact on its ability to conduct electricity. It's just the color of the insulation. <laughs> it will have an, an a impact on your ability to understand the circuit once you've build it, built it, but uh, that it, like that, I mean, that's a, it's a valid question, right? Like does the wire color matter? I see a lot of different wires up there. Like I have a bunch of different color wires. If, you, if you're in the point where you don't know anything, then it's a valid question. Sure. Because, you know, resistors that are different colors aren't electrically equivalent. No. And, I mean, maybe that... There is, are LEDs for that matter. I mean, obviously, the, it's the wire gauge that really matters, its ability to conduct well or not. But that's more... I mean, imagine how much easier it would be if you could just look at a wire and go, oh, that's red. I'm, I can put, you know... 50 amps through that. <laughs> Which some kinds of connectors are a little bit like that, where like the spade connectors, you know, yeah. those are color coded uh, for their wire gauge. And I think also because of their wire gauge, um, their how much they can conduct also uh, factors in there. Mm -hmm. And also, what crimping tool you should use for them. Okay, so this is ground. We're going to go with our old tradition of white as ground. Tyler, you're going to heat shrink these as well, I'm assuming. Yeah. Do you want me to prep some little short pieces of heat shrink while you're doing that? Um, yeah, we've got this blue stuff here that, I mean, I'm... Perfect. That should still fit over the end of the, the header. Double check that real quick. It does. Good. Just, just barely. I've done a correct thing. What are your favorite YouTube channels you folks are watching? I'm curious about you too, Tyler and Mike, but also anybody in the chat. Do you have any cool channels you've been really liking lately? I could use some new channels to watch. Um, I don't know that I have um, that many new ones that I've been following. Well, ones that you like that you think I haven't heard of yet. <laughs> um, I don't even know that I, I mean, there's a, a lot of favorites that I, I keep coming back to over and over again. Um, they're kind of my YouTube comfort food. I mean, every uh, Laura Comp video is always great. Um, I was Speaking of very macro. Yeah. Um, I always enjoy um, machining stuff from uh, This Old Tony. Um, his stuff is really great. Um, I don't know. These are like the people I just I like to watch because I enjoy like, their, their presentation. Um, and just how they how they present their ideas. Um, Cactus Workshop is one I really like. Mm -hmm. um, I love his like kind of punk rock aesthetic to the way he approaches videos. Um, yeah, I group him and Jocko whatever together in my mind sometimes in terms of their uh, <laughs> attitude. I'm not sure if either of them would be offended by that. <laughs> Oh, Jocko's, I mean, I love Jocko's channel too, but uh, his stuff is always so polished. Whereas, like, I don't know, uh, uh, Cactus Workshop is more like, hey, let's bash some stuff together and make a skateboard fidget spinner kind of thing. And more of a. Spinner? Is that a thing? Well, he, he made a. Back when fidgets, everybody was making fidget spinners, he made a huge one that was like this wide. Um, he, the bearing in it is from like some, he, he has some junkyard near him and he just found this industrial bearing. Got um, it. And cool. Then the two counterweights on either side were just like big formed pieces of concrete. Um, let's see. I haven't checked yeah, there's it. recommendations in the chat. Um, I haven't checked in on her in a little bit, and I'm hoping she's going to be at New York. Um, 
is a maker called Juni Genius. Um, I think I'm doing yellow to blue because okay. that doesn't make any sense at all other than I already, I have green and green will go with green. Um, yeah, she does a lot of comedy with, like she builds insane contraptions that don't work well. Um, I hate to draw the immediate comparison to somebody like Simone Yetch because um, that's really unfair. But uh, yeah, she, she makes neat, cool things and uh, utterly wild pre presentation style that I can, I can never look away from. What's her name again? Junie Genius, J-U-N-I-E. Got it. Subscribed. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, I got all those other ones already. Yeah. I'm a I, Tony fan, too. I need to, I need to dig in there and, and find some, some cool new stuff to recommend. There's a few coming in on the, uh, on the chat here as well. Brian Ashman recommends the Great Scott channel. Oh yes, Great Scott, good good stuff for electronics. Mm -hmm. Orpheus Romus is recommending uh, Ivan Miranda or Ivan Miranda's 3D printing electronics. He's a 3D printing electronics guy from Spain. Oh yeah. Uh, Man Crafting's recommending Fowler's Makery and Mischief. I don't recall off the top of my head like how big her channel is or not, but um, I know that I learned about it from working with Donald on Maker Update now that we've been doing that, but uh, Barb Noren from Barb Makes Things. Um, she's one of my favorites. Yeah, she's fantastic. Good tips, good projects. Good use of my time. I struggle with these longer, like videos, I don't know if you've noticed this, Tyler, doing videos for many years. Um, they've gotten longer. They really it, have yeah. been. Yeah, like two and a half, three minutes was the most you could get someone to watch. And now like I'm seeing maker videos at like 15 minutes long and they're great, but I can't, I can't be a fan of like 15 different cool makers if they're all gonna publish 15 minute videos every week. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I would really, I still need to set aside the time to sit down and watch um, Laura's one day build with uh, Adam, the ridiculous. Oh, I couldn't. Oh, I skipped. I skimmed around. I couldn't because it's just too long. Like, come on, guys, make a teaser for us. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, the only one of those, like one of Adam's videos that I ever watched that was that long, and I watched the whole thing. And it's funny that this is the one I pick, but also it's a really good one. I think everybody should try and watch it at some point. It's it's when he was machining a bunch of fittings for like a spacesuit replica he's working on. And it was it was a bad day of machining for him. Like nothing worked. And the reason why I say it's good for everybody to watch is first to watch it, you know, watch Adam Savage having a bad day in the shop. It makes you feel a little bit better about your day, your bad days in the shop, because everybody has them. And they suck. And they will steal your confidence and make you feel like you have no business doing this. <laughs> But then you watch somebody like Adam Savage doing that and kind of talking through the process of like how he's going to approach in the future and like when he needs to walk away from it for the day. Um, I think these are good things to reinforce. It's like it's okay to be bad. Totally. It's also okay to edit your mistakes into a three minute long video. Yep. <laughs> like but Barb. We were talking about Barb and how her videos have such a nice, concise. Uh, she talks about failing. She talks about trying things for the first time as a kid and how take like kids have lower grip strength. And so designing mm -hmm. projects for them, is a little bit different and, and she never goes over like six minutes. Yeah. I try to, and, and then of course I also watched, um, Lauren Simone's latest collaboration, which is, uh, the tampon dispenser, yeah, that tampon thing Pez dispenser. And I was also grateful. It's like, Oh, I, this is only 10 minutes. I can, I can watch this before I'm even getting out of bed this morning. That's yeah, okay. right. I one time made a, a TV be gone in a tampon case. Because <laughs> I bring both of those things to a restaurant. And that's where I was using the TV be gone most. So it seemed logical to me. Yeah. All right. So, fingers crossed, we are perilously close. Perilously close. To 
maybe utter disappointment? On the precipice of social media stat counting. Although really thinking okay. here. Very satisfying. I'm, I'm watching the stream like, you know, I, I can't see, my view doesn't show your hand, so I watched the stream. The stream is like a few seconds delayed All right. and your tubing is extremely satisfying. Oh, good. Get smaller. Maybe that's the... Uh, it's the, the Boca, man. The next, the the next Boca. sensational YouTube channel or Instagram channel. Heat shrink tubing, that's, shrinking. That's heat shrink tubing? Yeah. I follow Just that. Watching yep. heat shrink form yeah. around various shapes. Have you well, got... and your your heat your tool the uh, uh, what's it called the blower the heat the, gun the heat gun has a bit of an ASMR thing about oh, it. Oh, nice. Have you guys seen the um, the the laser rust m removal channels? People. Oh. Oh my God, that's that that that's a one of those instant addiction channels. It's just rusty things being cleaned with high powered lasers. And they make devices specifically to do that. And it is absolutely captivating. Totally oh wow, addictive. I have no idea. Yeah. Now I'm wondering if anybody has attempted to combine ASMR and making. Not that I know of. Yet. Yet. Although we've said it. So I mean, I've thought about it, but I just I don't need people fetishizing me any more than they already do, honestly. Yeah, yeah, that that's a thing. Objectification always happens when you're the minority in a group, right? And uh, yeah, highlighting it is can, you have to like lean way into it or lean way out of it. All right, so now I am starting to connect things to this board here. I'm guessing because we want to get the five volts, we want to plug it into V in, and ground is right next to it. And then I probably need to look up to figure out what pins SEL and SDA are on. I can look it up for you. What do you think I am here for? Idle entertainment? I got the circuit diagram right in front of me. It's, um... Let me pull this up on the camera. Here. It's the ones that are like closest to the antenna on the non power ground connection side. The numbers are just really small, and the, and the numbers on the board don't con, uh, don't relate necessarily to the numbers that you use in code either. That's a frustrating thing about the Node MCU. But the silk screen numbers are a little arbitrary. All right, so there's our board that we're looking at here. And I'm sorry, you said, so we've got green as data, and that goes where? So the third pin from the bottom on the opposite side from the power and ground connections. Um, D2, I think it is. I can't read the number, it's super D2. small. D2, okay. And then the yellow one goes to D1. If you used the same wiring for yellow and green as my circuit diagram did, which I'm pretty sure you did. Um, that is a great question. If uh, not, you can just switch them. It's not going to hurt it to get it backwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that could be wired up correctly. Green to D2, yellow to D1. Uh, green to D2, yellow to D1. Yes, that's, that's it. And now... Uh, I should probably turn my soldering iron off because I'm confident. <laughs> everything is Damn going it. Well. As soon as you turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the other nice thing about this soldering iron is that it heats up pretty quickly. Pretty quickly um, yeah. I had a USB micro connection. Well, so now that I'm looking at it again, and if you're going into VIN, that's supposed to be the voltage that's coming in from the USB port. So maybe it's not, it's not going through the voltage regulator. I mean, and it should just pull, be pulling the 5 volts from the USB. Yeah, from the USB, and that means that if it's drawing significantly more power than mine, you just won't be able to power it from your laptop. You'll have to plug it into, like, a 2-amp uh, USB power brick or something. I may need to find one of those. 
But like you said, uh, the numbers, if that's if all the numbers are on at once. So I, I doubt you're going to run into a problem firing it up, but I just thought of it as a concern for uh, increasing the size of the panel does increase, potentially increases your power consumption. Is this the moment of truth? Um, well, I am now pulling up the um, Arduino IDE. Um, because I don't have any, I just plugged in power to the board, and I'm not seeing any lights or anything. But then I can't remember if this has any lights that should be displaying at the moment. So I'm going to pull up the IDE yeah. and see if um, it's powered on. I see the serial monitor. If it does, I'll pull that up, and then we can take a look at that for a moment. Hmm. I don't have anything on that serial monitor. That could be a worry. Did you press the, press the reset button while it's plugged in? Because it won't, if it's gone through its first like request cycle, it'll wait till the next cycle before it spits anything out. OK. Um, I haven't done that. That was a good tip. And now let's take a look. Um, hey, it's getting, so it's connected. It's alive. It's alive. Now, the thing I haven't done is flip this thing over to see if we're seeing anything on <laughs> the displays. Um, now, I can come back to the main camera here, and I can do the reveal for the camera, not necessarily for me. And let's see what we're looking at here. Although I have a monitor. For me, because I can see it. Oh, nothing yet. That's nothing. Nothing yet. Why is there nothing? Lots of reasons could be. Yeah. Um, I guess the first thing to check is voltage. Do I have some? Yeah, do you have a multimeter handy? We do have. Double check that your uh, clock and data are connect are indeed the, the same as I told you, the same as my tutorial that I was reading from me, like, you know, that we're in accordance because we did do some. I suppose I could. Um, and uh, swapping there. I'm just going to check a couple different displays here. Uh, that's reports four points. Hmm. Green is data. Four point six volts. I wonder how tolerant these are of being undervolted. Somewhat. Maybe not the white one or the blue one, but the red one certainly. Um, yeah, because these are red, yellow, and green. And your data line is your green connected to D two, and your. Yeah, and let me and let me double check the yellow. let me double check the code here as well uh, to make sure that that's what it ought to be. Well, it doesn't say in your code the pin. Oh, yeah, it does say pin, yeah, D D1 and D2. Well, it'll say in the code, it'll say the Arduino, uh, or sorry, the, um, I'll look too. That's what I mean to say. I also need to double check and make sure that all my addressing is correct. Although I should be at least see something. Yeah, exactly. You would see you would see numbers, and um, if they would just be in the wrong place if your addressing wasn't correct, because you have so many addresses that like something would show up. Although it's true that if you only had two, then I'm also looking at the wrong code here. I mean. Uh, this is just the YouTube one. I need to open recent and go to our DigiKey social tracker display. Mm -hmm. This is this is the real code. All right. Yeah. You don't dis you don't um, describe the pins in the code because they're the only I squared C pins on the ESP8266, so it assumes those pins. That makes sense. 
I remember that confusing me at first. Like, where do I set the pins? Because it's really normal to want to make sure your pins are addressed right. But it's all in that I squared C addressing, and you just have to make sure that data is to D2 and clock is to D1. And that your power supply is beefy enough, I guess. Right. Maybe that's what I'm running up against here. Is that well, I just? I would, check, I would check the wiring accuracy first. Um, yeah, I definitely have. Like yellow is clock, um, and that's in D1, and uh, green data. Uh, green is data, and that is going into D2. So assuming the silk screen is accurate. Yeah. Then That's we should be design. good there. And otherwise, I think that's the next step is to find a beefier power supply. Yeah, I mean, what do you have it plugged into now? I have it plugged into my MacBook Pro keyboard. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's probably not doing what we need. Only deliver like 500 milliamps through the USB port. What is this guy here? But it would theoretically be like restart. You would see. I think you would see some symptoms of underpower, besides it just not working. That's yeah. my hunch. Like you would see it constantly restarting because it would try to draw power and then it would reset. Yeah. Well, let's see. Because I have a uh, 2.4 amp supply here. That should be beefy enough. We'll yeah. want to hit that reset button. And the other question, the other thing you could try is to just use the uh, reload it with the I squared C matrix backpack sample code. Yeah. Just to just to make sure that it's not something else. And of course, now we don't have the serial monitor anymore, so we're just going to have to um, wait for it to connect, and then hopefully display something cool on these numbers. <laughs> That never happens for live demo. It's just like it does it to fight you. It totally would have gone by now. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. You have the um, you have the the Arduino IDE up, right? Can you pull up the sample matrix backpack code? Yeah. It's in. Um, for those of you watching at home, you can get to the any library it comes with sample code. You just go to File Examples and then find the name of the library. In this case, it's what Adafruit LED Backpack Library. Yep. And then it is the um, Seven Seg is the name of the sample code that'll work with those those backpacks. Yep. Let's. And and you'll only be testing one of them, and uh, that way it'll consume even less power and it'll just light up one and that'll just verify that your bus is effectively working. Your I squared C bus. LED backpack, um, where's our seven, seven seg, yeah. Seven seg. That's what I write, whenever I um, am starting a new project, I usually start out with the sample code for each individual element I'm adding and just to make sure that I've got my wiring right, because the sample code is guaranteed to be working, hopefully anyway. And um, then you can you use it, like we can determine whether or not it's us or the wire connections, because if it doesn't work with the sample code, then it's probably a physical problem right. versus a software problem. Yeah. And it's uploading now. And that seems like a physical problem. All right, no. Because you're not getting anything, right? Nothing. Not seeing anything. Your bottom one from my view. Yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, lift it up a little bit higher so the oh the banner doesn't block it there. Okay. Then when it's not on, we want to be checking continuity now, right? 
you un like power it down and then check, use your multimeter to check continuity between all of the wire connections that you made. Yeah. Because if you have a short somewhere, a short between data and, and clock, that could cause what's happening right now. Yeah. Let's see. You probably don't have a short with power because you measured the voltage already. Where did you measure the voltage at the back of the I, I wasn't that careful. I was just jumping between um, uh, the power and ground on the board itself, not like power the board, and... not the backpack. Yeah. Ah, well, okay. Well, no, I mean, no, I'm sorry. The, the like, checking voltage between um, uh, the backpack and the ground pin on the backpack. Right, right. yes, that's... But, but we want you to check continuity while the circuit is off between the between data and clock to make sure there's no connection. And then between each, uh, between the, the pin on the microcontroller board and each of the backpack pads for both clock and data. Does that make sense? Yeah. But continuity you have to test while the circuit's powered down. All right. Um. I'm not sure if this is necessary to check continuity for all the voltage connections, but let's do that. Well, I'm mainly concerned that you could have a short between data and clock, and, data or clock and something else. Yeah. You want to make sure you don't have continuity between any of the four connections that shouldn't be connected to each other, and then and make sure that you do have a good solid connection between clock on the microcontroller and clock on the backpack. So Becky, would the fastest way for making sure we don't have any continuity between... Well, that's that's a worry, because I'm... You're not getting... Right now I don't have continuity from... Oh, that's the wrong pin. Still not hearing anything. If you The fastest way to check if you don't have continuity is just to check the continuity, and if it doesn't beep, then you don't have a connection. <laughs> Okay, there it is. That's that's the continuity I'm looking for. So it can be used as a positive test and a negative test. Yeah. That you don't have a short and that you do have good. Because, you know, some of those bigger solder connections you made, maybe the solder doesn't go all the way through. That could be a thing. That was a worry. And it looked good when you did it, but that doesn't mean it's not worth double checking or at least mentioning to our audience that that's a thing to try or the thing to check for with the multimeter. Right. Okay. Um, so far, I have good continuity between uh, data, and it's not being bridged to um, clock. And let's do the opposite check. Or ground or power. So I didn't check for ground or power. Yeah, make sure it's also not shorted to power or ground. Also not. Great. And if one of these is shorted, would it affect the entire display? Or would yeah. it just, it would, it, would, it would do all of them? Because the data and clock connections, they have to have, uh, they have to be able to move stuff signal freely along them, right? And if you connect one to power or ground, the, like a ground connection would just suck the signal straight to ground because power travels on the path of least resistance towards ground. And then if you had it shorted to power, it would just be like trying to have a conversation while the fire alarm is on because there would just be power flooding the bus. And then a, an individual signal would not be able to like uh, uh, get through. Do you, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Huh. Well, these connections seem good. Now I'm wondering what else to check. What about- One of our chat members is trying to help and asks if we have common ground, but I do believe that that's what we just checked for and common ground is happening. I mean, we can I haven't checked for continuity for ground yet, but we can certainly do that. Well, you checked you checked voltage while it was on, which effectively checked continuity on all of the power and ground. 
Because if you were getting a, a voltage, a positive voltage reading when it was on, that means that it's it's connected to power and ground. Yeah. Yep, ground all sounds good. What about is it is there a chance we have the uh, the data pins plugged in to the uh, into the or the, the data wire and the clock wire into the the wrong pins? It's possible. We double checked it twice, but that doesn't that does not negate the possibility that it could still be backwards. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Let's, so, like, barring another thing to try, that wouldn't hurt to try. I mean, is this just we're googling Node MCU? You swap, no, if you just swap the paint, the yellow and green wires on your Node MCU board, um, it would satisfy Mike's curiosity that even though we double check it three times, it right. still could possibly be backwards. Yeah. Well, it doesn't hurt to try. Right. And I just keep thinking about the silk screening being maybe. Silk screening is fine. It's just a matter of like us keeping uh, where's the where's the error likely to be usually pro head cat right problem exists between keyboard and chair yeah yeah and I hold this that's up the most, that's more likely than the silk screen being wrong you know, hold this up and and be optimistic let's go but you know being optimistic like it gets you really far in electronics except for this the last little troubleshooting bit being optimistic will not make your circuit work when it's broken. No. <laughs> I just don't understand how it's broken. Wah, 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 wah. Well, if I were doing this project over again, I would recommend you get one seven segment display working before you add more because of the um, possibility of like the complexity getting larger as the before you, like you want to have incremental success. And in that way, you'd be like, oh, well, I know one is working. So when I added more and it stopped working, like I know that the problem exists somewhere in that assembly process where right now when all six of them are connected and we can't get any of them on, uh, my next suggestion is to like, do you have a spare one or could you disconnect one and, ha and like go back to just uh, okay. trying to get one display to light up, the one without any um, alterations to the I squared C bus pads on the back. Yeah, then, unfortunately, I don't have that. I don't have any spares of this. But you do, can you identify which one is the one with no alterations to the um, I squared C bus? Because that's the one that the sample code wants to talk to. Yeah, that's this upper, that's this one here. On this your... One. Yeah, the on one your, I'm indicating with my finger here. Low digits of the, of the top one. Yeah, that yep. makes sense. And so, like, that's the one that I probe at more now. Probe, like, if you're testing continuity and stuff, make that the one that you test. Although I'm sure you've tested them all already. Yeah. Yeah, because here we're looking at, although I think now we actually have our data stuff reversed, but that doesn't matter for continuity. Although I probably shouldn't be checking the continuity here with the circuit. Well, it's power on. You, just won't get, you just won't get an accurate reading. Yeah. Well, then let's not do that. Power. And ground. Um, hmm. And you're touching the actual pad. Yeah. And as much as you can, right? So that you're actually testing the strength of your solder connections and not just measuring the wire in between the solder connections. Yeah, I'm trying to you know jam it into the the solder pad there. Mm -hmm. Huh. Okay. And when you powered up that one, is that the one you tested for voltage already? Yeah. I mean. Um, Again, that's the only other thing I can think of is, well, let's check voltage from the solder pad all the way back to the board, the ground pad yeah. on the board, just for fun.
Somebody in the chat's asking where the API endpoint is. Where the API endpoint is? Yes, but it's, it's, uh, what does the endpoint refer to? The JSON that you get back when you request the, when you make the request? I'm not sure what he means by endpoint. I've only heard that term mentioned. The, but the library code uh, logs in as you, like you put your Twitter API key in the Arduino sketch and then it, it requests the data and it gets the JSON, the, Ar the Arduino library parses the JSON that it returns from the API request. And in Instagram's case, it's not a true API. It's more of a it's a more informal web service. Well, that's a solid five volts across all of these displays, tracing that all the way back to the ground pin on the board. Boop boop ba doo. Do you have a different Arduino you can test with this with these guys? Um, you mean like a a different Node oh, MCU? Yeah. yeah, because I'm thinking of uh, you know when you're troubleshooting, you try to isolate uh, and different variables yeah. and the controller disappear off camera for a second here to go grab another one. But yeah, BRB. Oh, he meant the, the URL of API to be requested. Well, it's different for each service. So this project combines Twitter, Instagram, my version also uses Instructables, Tyler's is using YouTube, so the the UR, the address that it uh, sends the API request to is different for each of the services, and it's in the Arduino API libraries that Brian wrote that are used, uh, all of them that are used in this project. And also in the Facebook, Bob Zimmer is highlighting a troubleshooting idea that we did already try. Did you check to make sure that you don't have green to ground or yellow to ground? We did check that to make sure there's no continuity between data clock uh, and each other or power and ground. Yeah, that I feel pretty good about. All right. Handy Rhett really wants to know about the Facebook API. We, neither of us are using the Facebook web uh, channel as one of our social channels for this project, but Brian did write a, a Arduino Facebook API library that you could use in a similar way. Once you get this base code working, it, you'll see how obvious it is to swap out something for Facebook, but neither of us have done it ourselves. Yeah. Becky, can you remind me, um, yellow is clock is D1? Yellow is clock is D1. Okay. Correct. Then this is our fresh new Node MCU. Going to plug it into the computer and send the code to it. And hopefully this will give us something good. And this is still the, uh, the are we going to go with the display one or, this, or the, the sample code? Maybe we should go with the sample code. Well, the sample code has serial output, which will be useful for you to notice that your node MCU is actually trying to display the correct number. And then, you know, the next thing will be all like, I would like to take a look at your code and walk through it. But uh, after we, if it doesn't work on the regular sketch and if it doesn't work on the test sketch, if it doesn't work on the test sketch, then like, uh, it's it could be possible that you soldered your um, backpacks on upside down. Uh-oh, Tyler, did you solder your backpacks on upside down? Uh, I matched them to the silkscreen diagram on the on the, the backpack itself. Cool. So if I did solder them upside down, that's on Adafruit. <laughs> OK, so I have sample code running on the new Node MCU and no display. Is it reporting to the serial monitor? Um, let's find out. No, no, it's not. It's interesting. Although, 
that's probably because serial is set up for a 9600 baud. And nice I was set on 11.5200. Oh, okay. Let me reset it here. There we go. Although, now you can actually see. But it just says backpack test. Now, I'm not sure if it. Backpack test is the regular, it's the sample code from the library, from the seven segment library. I'm just trying to see if it writes anything else to serial more than that. I don't know if it does. It won't. No, it doesn't. The okay. sample sketch just writes seven segment backpack test. But it should display uh, different numbers and words. Um, it should display a counting number on your low digit display. I looked at look at the product page and and you did not solder yours upside down. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's comforting. Yeah. Although, unfortunately, I'm at a getting to a point where I might need to do a little bit more of this off camera because um, I have another thing that I need to get to, and that's pretty soon. I see. Yeah, we have been at it for a while. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's useful for us to discuss all the different uh, troubleshooting options. So I would say if you can't get the seven segment sample code working, then you're definitely not going to be able to get the project code working because you need to be able to talk to one display before you can talk to six. That seems um, reasonable. And uh, um, what a pity. And you, it looked like you did everything right, but it's still possible you have a cold solder joint somewhere, although we've tested continuity, so not likely. Um, but I guess your next step would be to t uh, desolder one of these displays so that you can test it in an isolated environment without so many solder joints in between it and the board. Yeah, right. Just to double check that it's not your soldering, but it didn't look like it was. But you know, the proof is in the pudding. If it's not working, it's not working. Yeah. Um, well, that's you can also test. Uh, it, like, say, because here's the thing: when you're talking, we're talking about deductive reasoning here. The, the things that are possible to go wrong are that, like, um, the most likely things are that we did some kind of wiring or soldering mistake that we can't see right now. Uh, less likely are there's some kind of manufacturing problem, and that you could test for that by changing the address in the test code and trying to test one of the other displays. So, like, change the address to. Um, did, uh, so without uh, modifying your matrix backpacks that you already changed the addresses on, you can change the address in the in the test code to 071 or 074 to get your uh, to run that test on the other individual matrix backpacks, which is the way to test and make sure that your first matrix backpack isn't uh, broken. Because if one of them is broken, I'm not sure if it would affect the rest of them or not. Yeah, yeah. This is where I just need to like pair down and make sure I'm I didn't... Sorry, but desolder one and try it by itself. Right. Yeah. Yep. I'm sorry, Tyler. Boop, boop. Well, if you want to cut to me, you can show the working one that I have in my hand. Okay. We can, <laughs> we can do that. For some, for some narrative closure. There we go. These things Anyways. work. I yeah, it totally does work. And we're, you know, projects take more than one session sometimes to get right. Yeah. And when you get them working, you get the different displays. Uh, this is the one where there's three in one, and then this is the YouTube one. Uh, so you can see that if you have fewer than 10,000 subscribers, you can get away with just one of the four digit displays. And then if you have more, you can add on another one and have the number be continuous uh, in front of, or like across the two displays. Yeah. OK. I'm confident you'll get it working, Tyler, without the pressure of us all watching you. <laughs> um, well, so that was our attempt at building the uh, social status tracker uh, on Make Live. Um, sometimes it goes well. Uh, most of the time it goes well, but sometimes you end up with something like this. Um, I, I promise I'll get this figured out, and I'll post something to social about what the issue was uh, so that you can kind of follow along. I, I think I just need some offline time with this to to figure it out and, uh, and troubleshoot it. Um, in the meantime, uh, I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, watching this and all the great comments and, 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 and questions that you asked. Um, of course, want to thank 
uh, Becky for, for joining us and, and all, that, all of her expert advice that she helped with along the way, as long as uh, creating this project in the first place. Thanks for having me. This was a bunch of fun. Yeah, and for anybody who, for some reason, doesn't know who you are and what you do, uh, where can they find you on social media or keep up with uh, what you're working on? Sure. Well, my freshest stuff is out on Instructable, since that's where I work. But you can also find me on Twitter and YouTube and Instagram uh, at Bekathwia, B-E-K-A-T-H-W-I-A, or just Google my name, Becky Stern, and you'll find one of the hundreds of project tutorials that I've made on the Internet over the years. Cool. <laughs> My dog came to visit for the goodbye also. Aw, hello. <laughs> and um, of course, uh, for, for us, well, we also need to thank our good friends at DigiKey uh, who make this stream possible. Um, if you're, once again, not familiar with who they are, they're an electronics distributor. Uh, they sell all the components that you can put into this project as well as anything that you uh, are working on or want to be working on. They sell it, they ship fast, they're awesome to work with, and uh, we will be looking forward to seeing them next week in New York. Um, but in the meantime, Mike, we have a stream that we're doing tomorrow That's afternoon because right. uh, we are going to be kicking off uh, Make Volume 65. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be joined by Aya from Little Bits and, and the rest of her team there. Yep. Um, uh, she's on the cover. And we're going to be talking through the new issue of the magazine. And of course, uh, next week is Maker Fair New York. Uh, where we're also going to be live streaming from there uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so if you're not, if you are in New York or nearby or don't mind the drive to get there, uh, get tickets, come out. It's an awesome show. If you can't be there, uh, be on the lookout for this. Uh, we'll be streaming the same place on Facebook and on YouTube. You can catch up with all the cool things, including Becky Stern's panel about documenting your projects and sharing them online. Uh, you can check that out and all the other cool stuff that we're going to be live streaming throughout the weekend. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you. Thank, everyone. Thank you, Becky, for joining us. Thank you for watching. Thanks to DigiKey for making this stream possible. And come back tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Where we're going to be kicking off uh, Make Volume 65. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. I remember what I told you. Yeah, yeah, don't make eye contact. He takes this as a personal challenge. Hello? Pat? Yes? Can I get a, uh... He'll take a Raspberry Pi 3. <laughs> no pie for you! <laughs> Told you. Hey, but I did hear this new deli. I can go pick up the sandwiches. No. Oh. Don't be held hostage by the board. Go to digikey.com to find thousands of boards in stock, all ready for immediate shipment.